Welcome everybody to the uh, ACTAG um, workshop named Interop Cubes, uh, run by Grimshaw um, Architects as part of the ACTAG event, uh, summer event 2021. Uh, before we start, we'd like very much to thank, first of all, uh, Thor Thomas Eddy Core Studio for uh, inviting us to be co-hosting this uh, amazing event, which has been a point of reference uh, for some time now. Um, today, we're running the, sec the, the second session, basically. Um, yeah, so um, as I said, please feel free to write in the chat. We'll be responding there. We don't really see people uh, using it. Right, so uh, yes, today we'll be running the second day um, of um, a workshop. Uh, as we said in the email, there are two sessions. First one, uh, we'll be looking at interoperability on the Rhino, Revit to Rhino side of uh, utilizing Rhino side technologies. In the second session, we will be focusing on Unity uh, Reflect, uh, which is an exciting piece of technology. We want to demonstrate uh, potential pathways of how we could utilize it, basically. Um, just as a uh, very quick, let's say, um, introduction and overview, I'm just going to uh, share on the screen in a second. Uh, let me know when you can see it. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, interoperability cubed, we said. I'm uh, just going to quickly introduce our ourselves. So um, uh, I'm Yoros uh, Takiridis. I'm the lead computational design manager here at Grimshaw, at our London studio. Uh, with me today, we've got um, Natalia Wojtovic, uh, computational designer as well at Grimshaw. Uh, Justina Sichowska, and a computational design specialist, and Paris Nikitidis, who's our uh, XR specialist here at the London studio. A few things about uh, our department. Grimshaw Design Technology uh, is a fundamentally a support group uh, for Grimshaw architects. It consists of three main pillars, computational design, BIM, and XR. Uh, we provide day-to-day -day project support to our, to our architects. Uh, we're full-time specialists. Uh, basically, we're a global team. We have representatives across all of our uh, studios uh, around the world. And as I said, we provide project support, uh, but also we um, undertake research initiatives in areas such as advanced fabrication, machine learning, urban computation. And uh, we're really trying to uh, merge and bring in, let's say, the state of the art, let's say, technologies that are available and try to incorporate them into the way we think, design, and deliver architecture here at Grimshaw. Um, so today the workshop will, as I said, we'll have two, three, let's say, fundamental pieces of technology. We will start with a Revit model, which you can find in these um, in the G drive that we sent to you, so you can download it. And we're just going to say a few words about what this actual model is and what is it actually we're building we'll be working with. We're going to send. Um, we're going to run through the basics of how to bring geometry inside uh, Rhino. Um, and run quickly some uh, basic environmental analysis. And then uh, we're going to take all that information both from our, both from our BIM model and uh, from Rhino and bring it inside Unity and start actually uh, pulling some data and uh, producing some uh, supposedly interesting uh, visualization ways to represent basically that data and create an immersive experience that uh, potentially uh, could just tell us uh, Few more things about the space, um, about the building actually we'll be uh, looking at rather than just the spatial qualities, but actually understand a few things about the potential performance. Um, this is a simple diagram of the workflow, as we said. So the key here is uh, reflect and how we're going to be pushing basically uh, information both from Revit and uh, from uh, Rhino, basically. Um, bringing it everything inside this uh, Unity uh, project using the Reflect technology. We're going to be looking first at um, Reflect Review, which is an off-the-shelf um, product that Unity are offering. And you also have, with this 30, di uh, 30 days trial license, you actually have uh, access to both Review and the developer um, 
uh, side of things, which is actually the interesting part. And we're going to be uh, looking in, uh, you know, under the what's happening under the hood, let's say, inside Unity. Uh, we're going to be exploring the way uh, Reflect um, structures the data it receives and how we can access it and how we can, you said, uh, potentially interesting things with it. Uh, now, a few things about the, the actual model we'll be looking at. This is the Bath School of Arts and Design. It has uh, opened a few years ago, and it's a very interesting project, uh, project for us uh, at Grimshaw um, for two main reasons. First of all, because it's always exciting to be working on an educational building uh, because of the, you know, the versatility and the flexibility that it requires, especially if we're talking about a School of Arts and Design. The second thing is that actually, this is the second life of this building. The original building was built in 1976. It was the Herman Miller factory. And it was one of the first, um, you know, one of these pioneering um, modular uh, industrial uh, based uh, buildings that Nicholas Grimshaw designed uh, back in the 70s. And you can see him uh, inspecting one of these uh, innovative at the time FRP panels. So, um, the whole idea today is we're going to see how we take this uh, basically uh, this space that used to be a factory and we will be focusing particularly on this uh, modular curtain wall system right uh, where each of these panels can be you know uh, either a solid frp panel or this glazed unit right um, and therefore potentially re, uh, create a workflow where we can see how the uh, performance the environmental performance with regards to radiation and also the daylight natural daylight that it provides for the different areas. Um, it could be explored, uh, let's say, uh, through different uh, design iterations. Um, uh, Natalia, don't, uh, would you like to uh, talk a bit about the, these two? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I think, yeah, the, the, the image is want to cooperate be. as yesterday. Um, so, so we've decided to use radiation and daylight analysis um, to um, to sort of showcase. I don't um, think I can hear you. Is that only myself? Yeah, it's only you. Can everybody else yeah, hear me? Everyone else can hear me. Good. We can hear you well. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I will. Um, I, I will. I will knock when I'm finished, to August. I will send you a message. Um, so yeah, so we've we've decided to to um, do a solar study um, to present the sort of um, how environmental analysis can fit into the workflow that um, that, that that we want to showcase. Um, but it doesn't have to be you know solar analysis. It just lends itself well to the type of visualizations that we'll be showing you in Unity, um, and also um, you know we can fairly quickly turn around uh, meaningful um, insights uh, from, from very simple um, workflow. So, so we will be looking at radiation and daylight. And uh, for those of you who, who don't do environmental uh, sort of on daily basis, um, the, the idea is that uh, from the radiation analysis, we uh, will, um, we will um, pull uh, data associated with the um, solar energy that either hits the facade of the building or gets into the building. And that can inform our um, decisions for um, design aspects such as PV panels or overheating controls. So shading uh, for, for, the, for, the, um, for the glazing uh, areas. Um, so yeah, there, there are many design aspects that, that um, are uh, are used that 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 use uh, radiation analysis, and the second aspect, and and that analysis is very much um, based on particular lo location of the project, and also uh, the orientation of the building uh, is very important um, when when radiation uh, is is being measured. Um, the second analysis is daylight, and that's much more sort of location independent. So here we are. Um, running uh, the daylight factor analysis, average daylight factor, which is literally measuring the average illuminance inside of the space that we are um, that, that we are analyzing um, versus the illuminance outside under sort of overcast cloudy sky condition. And of course we want to um, we want to maximize the daylight, um, but at the same time we don't want to um, 
exceed certain thresholds when it comes to radiation that gets inside the building. So that's why we want to sort of uh, showcase those two analyses so that um, in real time, uh, the user can have an idea of uh, sort of how to balance the two um, with the glazing design. Um, and, you know, yeah, the, the, the glazing ratios and um, potentially the shading. Um, so yeah, that's, so that's why that's why we chose these two. And this is the sort of basis of it. But um, we could we could do any other kind of analysis. We could do CFD. We could do acoustic. Um, so you know, the the sort of there, there is a massive world of possibilities there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, as we said, it's more of a uh, the focus is particularly in the workflow, and we hope that you know you can find that. Uh, interesting enough to take it uh, from here and kind of explore uh, you know, all sorts of uh, pathways. Um, so I think with this, we can just uh, jump in on the technical side. Uh, for those of you that have already downloaded the Revit file, you can just go ahead and open it, uh, open that model. I'm uh, just gonna stop sharing the screen for a second. Um, Is it okay if we open it with like Ryan, uh, Revit 21 or something? I think it should be, yeah, it should be yeah. okay. okay. Um, we've tested it, as we said, with Unity uh, 2020. Um, but yeah, uh, it should be fine. Give it a second. A bit of a technical uh, pickup here. Um, there is a question here in the chat here was uh, if this is will work with Revit 2019. Um, I don't think so. Uh, we would have to know because the the model is uh, in 2020. Um, yeah. And um, Natalia, I don't know actually. Do you have the the model? Sorry, uh, Ravi just crashed while well, we were presenting. Yeah, sure. Um, Do you want to share? I'm, I'm also just uh, swapping the files right now. So if you just give me a second, let's make sure that mine doesn't crash. I think it's OK. Uh, yep. Yeah. Got it. OK, so. Right, let's start from Revit. So if everything has gone well with installation of right inside, you should be able to, first of all, if you, once you open the model, you should be able to see that uh, part. Actually, uh, it's there is a scope box uh, there activated. Uh, and yeah, you can see there, like we have given you, basically we've provided you with half of the actual building in terms of the detailed uh, components, and then the rest is a simple mass. Um, if we want to, if so, if right inside has been successfully installed, you should be able to see that new toolbar um, at the top. Uh, and if you fire up the, the icon at the very left, you start basically right inside. Now, um, for those of you that are familiar with Rhino, uh, you will see. Sorry, Natalia, if you want to go back to Revit for a second. Yes, you will see a series of uh, buttons there that uh, should look very familiar. The first one is Rhino. You can actually start a new Rhino document um, inside Revit. The other one just, oh, you know, you can, you can open a viewport. Interesting thing is that you can, uh, for those of you that are uh, for Python users, you can actually develop directly here uh, your Python scripts. Or you can uh, simplify up Grasshopper. Um, 
And of course, you know, there's some basic functionality in terms of like how you view uh, the different elements. Um, the final bit is the, the grasshopper player, let's say, with which you can evaluate directly the grasshopper definition without necessarily opening it and um, uh, having to, to, to run it through uh, grasshopper itself which we find uh, very useful when it comes to known specialists actually using some of the graph over definitions we're developing. Um, this time we're going to just start, as Natalia said, we have already uh, clicked the first the Rhino uh, button. We have opened a Rhino document. And uh, we can fire up Grasshopper. And if you want to be um, following, uh, you can download the Grasshopper definition that you can find on the G drive and open it. Um, so basically, the workflow that we're going to present here shows how to get geometry live, basically elements, BIM elements into Rhino by maintaining, first of all, the, the, uh, the metadata and the nature of them being BIM elements, and eventually extracting the geometry that's absolutely required to be running those two different types of uh, environmental analysis, right? So the end goal is, uh, for example, for the radiation to be able to extract that, that, that surface, which represent uh, the, the glass pane, if you want, the external uh, glass pane um, of a glazing unit. And then everything else will be working as uh, context, let's say, for that radiation analysis. And then for the daylight, the end goal is to be able to extract that, that floor for that room we will be performing daylight analysis uh, for. Again, the actual opening that provides the natural light into the space, and then everything else again is uh, context, right? Now, the first thing uh, that we would have to do is to provide a link. Um, we have to provide a link to the actual document, and the way to do that is uh, by utilizing this component, which is called like active document. Um, oh, but by the way, sorry, yes, right before we jump into this, in Grasshopper with the right hand side, uh, within right hand side, you will see, first of all, in the parameters in the first tab uh, of Grasshopper, in the very first, um, sorry, Natalia, yes, um, a series of um, uh, Revit primitives, right? That gives you um, the uh, capability to uh, reference elements from your Revit documents, um, different types of elements, that like a whole lot of different options, but also we have a, a plugin, uh, which is called uh, Revit, actually, here. Um, and this is the main part that we're using where we actually do all the manipulation of the elements, or we create new elements in Rhino and Grasshopper, and we bring them inside Revit. So the first thing is, as I said, to utilize this active document uh, component, which establishes the connection with the uh, document that we have at the moment. Um, so, for us, always good practice to make sure we reference that. Yeah. Um, right. So you can actually see, yes, uh, the the local copy uh, of the uh, central model that uh, Natalia has opened uh, in her uh, machine. Um, we use we uh, we use a data component to make sure that this is there. And now the the way we're going to start extracting geometry, basically, or the elements themselves, is through a very uh, specific workflow that we find very useful, and that is uh, by going through categories. So, in uh, fundamentally, yeah. So by using the query categories uh, component, and you can find that in. Uh, Sorry, just a second, Natalia. Like, uh, query categories is a component that can be found in uh, um, category. Yes, in, in the tab in here. Yeah, with the, in the in the tab which is called category query categories. That gives you a full list of all the categories that are in your document. Now, uh, of course, we can use you know the, the standard like list uh, components of Grasshopper and uh, retrieve. The categories we want, we sort of find more helpful to use the, uh, the, the, the menu, the, this uh, search menu, which is available um, as part of in, 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 in parameters. Um, the, the value the, picker. The, the value picker, yes, sorry. The value picker, which actually allows you to select any of the categories you want, or actually multiple categories. So if you uh, hold control and you, and you click in any of these 
categories, you can, you can select multiple. So in this case, for example, we will be extracting the elements that are within the ceiling and uh, floor uh, categories, right? Now, how to bring that in? Um, there is a major, there is a major uh, step here. Um, move a bit to, yeah, move a bit to the right. Um, yes, it's this document elements basically uh, component, which uh, once you bring it off the shelf, and probably we can just bring one. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. If we just bring one new. Um, just wanted to show that, um, yeah, the query elements. No, sorry, it's, um, if you go to, uh, yes, it's called query elements. There, and it's, yes, exactly. Um, now off the shelf, if you see, Sorry, no, I don't think it was the one. Uh... No, that, that's, the, that's the one, Natalia, it's fine. Yeah, so if you just zoom in. So off the shelf, it comes with a filter, right? And it comes with, uh, with two inputs, basically. The one is called filter, the other one is called limits. Now, uh, both of these are very useful, but we're missing the fundamental piece, which is if you, play, if you press plus button at the top. Sorry, yes that actually reveals the input that actually provides the link to the document, right? So that's the one we're interested in. So we can, if we connect that to our link documents, this is where we can actually start querying elements of the active document, right? Now, the next one is the filters, and we're gonna come in a second and discuss filters. The third one is, is a limit. It's an input that actually controls the limit, uh, the number of elements you can bring in, uh, from Revit inside uh, Grasshopper. And of course, this is very useful because you can imagine that you know, um, in a lot of occasions, you can have, uh, you know, hundreds, or if only if or not thousands of elements, and that could potentially, you know, um, pose a challenge for your, um, uh, the computation, let's say, in the computational side of uh, the, the system. Um, in this case, we don't need that. So we can just also, uh, you know, again, if you, if you zoom in, uh, you can see that you can, uh, sorry, I mean, yeah, you can bring that in or not. We're not going to use it this time. Um, so this is how we basically you bring elements from the uh, from the, your active document. Now, the next important thing to remember here is the concept of filters. So filters basically are, and there's a whole category you can see uh, up at the top uh, called filters. It's a whole lot of different uh, ways of filtering basically elements in Revit. There are uh, category filters, or class family filters. Um, we're going to see some of them. Uh, the one we're going to be using now is a category filter, right? So basically, what the category filter does is that you know it requires a category or a series of categories, let's say a list of categories as inputs, and we can get them from the list of, of the value picker that we have created. So you can see it's connected to the value picker actually, um, and that produces um, these um, as these outputs. Is this output is actually a a multi-category fil filter. Basically, it changes if you select only one um, filter. It's a single category. It's multiple. It's a multi-filter. Um, and we can use that. Um, we could use that straight up ahead um, and just filter you know, uh, our uh, document uh, and just get to this particular category. So for example, the ceilings and the floors. In this case, we're making something a bit more uh, uh, complex, which is, I'm gonna explain now, the, what is a logical filter? Basically for the purposes of like this particular workshop and for the economy of time, we don't want to be performing uh, radiation analysis in daylight for the, across the whole uh, you know, uh, side um, of the building, just to make things run a bit faster. So we have decided to actually um, run everything in a, in a particular area. So, we have introduced uh, a bounding box, let's say, that focuses on a, on a particular area of the project. Um, and it's a simple, you know, this bounding box is a simple B rep uh, and that we have, you know, we just uh, referenced from Rhino. Um, and if we see in relation, for example, if we just, uh, if you want to select one of the outputs, uh, the ceiling, for example, just to understand a bit where it sits with regards to the project. 
Yeah. So it's, it sort of sits uh, towards the western side of the, uh, of the building. It's one of these uh, uh, little office spaces uh, where actually um, we would get the equivalent of one uh, of, of two panels, let's say, that would sit uh, in the curtain wall system, a solid panel and then a glazed panel. Um, of course, if you want, you can always expand this area if, if you're brave enough and you have, uh, you know, uh, you have a, a, a strong uh, system we can rely on in terms of its specs. You can probably run it for the whole uh, building. Um, we actually have done this uh, in advance, so we're going to be using that part of that analysis, let's say, for the next step in Unity. But for now, we're just going to be focusing on this area. So basically, eventually, we want to extract geometry that sits within this bounded box. So um, in order to do that, we can combine and returning back to the filter logic, we can actually combine filters together. Um, and there are two ways. There, is, uh, there, there are two types of logical fil filters as you would expect uh, on the computational side of things. There is an end filter, logical end filter, which actually, uh, you know, um, it makes sure that both, like all the different filters, uh, the conditions for the filters are actually met. And there is an, a logical OR filter. So if any of the uh, filters are actually um, uh, valid, then uh, they will be passed on. And therefore, we will have uh, certain elements. In this case, we'll be using a logical end filter because we want the elements, for example, that belong to the ceiling or floor category and also um, have some sort of relationship with the bounding box. Now, the bounding box filter. Sorry, yes, yeah, so with our bounding box. Now, in order to, to bring that bounding box, we need to create a bounding box filter, right? Again, that's, that can be found in this filter category. And that itself has um, some interesting functionality. Um, I'm mostly interested about this, uh, this, this the strict or non-strict um, input. This basically controls if the elements you're getting are actually encompassed uh, by the uh, the bounding box, or if they have some sort of, if they intersect, they have some sort of spatial relationship. To them. For now, this is uh, uh, for this first step. Uh, the uh, we keep it to a, a, a false, false condition. So um, we want to have any sort of uh, element that has some some sort of geometrical relationship. We'll see later how we actually get to the actual, you know, geometries that sit within this bounding box. Okay, so we've got, uh, you know, our basic weapons, let's say, uh, we've got a way to, to select categories um, and actually elements from categories. We have the capacity to create filters and actually combine filters. And then ultimately we want to be able to access the geometry itself. In order to do that, we use the component which is called element geometry. Um, and that has, of course, as the inputs, the actual elements, and another interesting feature, which is the detail level. And that detail level corresponds to the rapid detail element, uh, level. Uh, so it has um, three um, options, like the coarse, medium, and fine, similar to how to what you would expect to find inside Revit. Again, very useful with regards to um, how, like, how, how much detail you want to be bringing with regards to your elements um, inside Grasshopper. Uh, for the purposes of this exercise, of course, we were using uh, a course um, level. And then, you know, through the experience, we've figured out that, uh, you know, uh, making sure that we, we clean our data st uh, structure, we clean our tree, and to make, just to make sure we don't have any invalid objects, we don't have any nulls, uh, it's always a good practice. Um, so, okay, um, if we just uh, look, look for, uh, for a second, what we have, um, sorry, let's let's talk about the floor first, Natalia, um, now that we're here. Yeah, so we have our ceilings and our floors. And if you see, as I said, we have uh, selected those that have some sort of relationship with this bounding box, right? Uh, but still, you can see we have a lot more geometry that we actually require. Now, we the next step is to sort of repeat that same process, but just for the floor because we want to be uh, extracting that analytical surface uh, that we're gonna use for our daylight simulation. Um, so everything is exactly the same as what we've shown uh, before. Obviously the only category we select is floors in this case, uh, we don't need ceilings. Um, the only thing 
Yes, exactly. The only thing we're adding is an additional filter, uh, which in this case is the level. And because our room is in the ground floor, uh, we just add this. So we're after that floor slab, that ground floor uh, slab, which we're going to use eventually as our analytical uh, surface. So we have chosen the geometry eventually, as we've seen. Um, yeah, we have selected the element. Um, and then the next thing we do is actually, you know, we're now in grasshopper territory or like if you want in Rhino kind of uh, geo hardcore geometry, let's say territory. We literally just perform an intersection, a very simple solid intersection to get that, um, that, that, that um, surface. So at first, of course, we get a, a, a solid there, uh, which is that part of, of, of the slab. And as you can imagine, I mean, this is like quite obvious, the operation that needs to happen. We just need to isolate that top face, let's say, of that, um, uh, of that piece of slab. In order to do that, very simply, you know, we can just find, uh, we just quickly get the, the centroids of these faces and just get the centroid that has the highest value in terms of, of Z, right? Um, uh, if anybody has any questions on this, we can just uh, spend a bit more time on it. Otherwise, yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of standard, let's say, method of just isolating that part of uh, geometry that we're interested in. Um, okay, so these these two parts are quite straightforward. I think the the more interesting, let's say, uh, part of the exercise has to do with um, the wall systems. Um, now, right inside has a dedicated, let's say, part of functionality just on working with walls and curtain wall systems. And it's that uh, tab at the very end um, on the right side. Um, and it has a whole lot of functionality, which we're going to look at. It makes our lives really easy in terms of like getting the, 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 the elements that we really need. And it can get really granular. So we, we're going to see um, the first type of inputs we have is this wall system family, which actually allows you to choose between, and actually, sorry, those can be found in inputs, um, in the input tab. Uh, yes. So the, at the bottom uh, left, you can see there is the component called wall system family. Uh, and if you bring that in, you can see that the, this allows you to, to switch basically between the basic walls or curtain walls. Um, in this case, for now, we're just going to be looking at the, 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 the basic. Because um, we are trying to get basically the walls of that room, right? Um, in order to get the actual elements, we need to perform this uh, query uh, uh, of walls. Um, which gives us all the, uh, let's say, the walls that we have uh, active uh, in, in the project. And um, as you might, you know, might have realized, the, the, we need a filter, right? We need some sort of uh, filter to be able to, to get the walls that we're particularly interested in. And they have to do, and they're related, as we said, somehow with the, this original bounding box. Um, now, we have our filter. And in this case, we show a different way of accessing the walls. Basically, through the filter, as you can imagine, this is a logical uh, sort of uh, function. So the output will be a true or a false if the element has actually passed the filter or if not, right? So this is a standard, let's say, list of um, uh, Boolean uh, uh, values. And therefore, using a standard uh, call pattern uh, from uh, Grasshopper, we can very easily filter that the list of the walls and actually get those ones that uh, pass the that meet the condition right that are within the boundary box, um, or as we said, a, a non-strict. Let's say they have a non-strict uh, relationship with the boundary box. Um, so again, we have the 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 output of this is the uh, element geometry, and then we can show how we actually get the actual walls. Um, or maybe, I don't know, Natalia, do you want to just, shall we do the curtain walls first? Um, I mean, so, so the internal walls are here. These are the ones that are intersecting with the bounding box. So I think that's 
Um, yeah, that's quite straightforward. That, that, that's here, but yeah, if, if we want okay, to. Okay, so let's look at the garden wall system. So uh, again, um, wall systems family as an input. This time we're going to look at the curtain wall. Um, and uh, this allows us, of course, to have access to our curtain wall, which is like the first part. But as I said, there is a series of components that allow us to get really granular to uh, the, the, the different parts of the uh, curtain wall system. Uh, the first thing uh, we want to do is to um, just use an element um, uh, type um, component, which actually gives us all the types of the um, the different elements that consist the, the, you know, of the, the curtain walls, right? Um, and, and there is this very useful component, component called analyze curtain wall type, which you can find in the wall category, which gives us a very detailed, let's say, um, breakdown of the different, first of all, the functions, um, but also you can see already here, we've got information about the actual grid, uh, layout, the spacing. So, um, we can have a lot of control, let's say, in the actual makeup of this uh, curtain wall system, which makes it very powerful, especially if we're talking about some sort of iter iterative process in which the results, for example, of the environmental analysis that we're doing could be used to close the loop in a way and uh, modify the actual curtain wall system that we have inside Rev. Now, uh, for the purpose of this exercise, we're going to look at the function. Um, and we're going to try to extract basically from this, uh, from all the different curtain wall systems, the, the, the parts that have to do with the exterior. Uh, in order to do that, there is this input type. Again, you can find it in inputs, in the inputs tab, uh, which is called wall function. Um, and again, standard grasshopper operation and equality uh, um, uh, function, which actually helps us to quickly separate uh, the exterior uh, wall types from uh, everything else. So again, standard uh, calling uh, operation from Grasshopper using a pattern. Um, and um, yeah, and obviously like the inverse of that would give us uh, all the internal uh, kernel walls uh, from which we can actually extract that uh, part of our walls of that room, which actually is, you know, the the door and how you, you access that, yeah, a, a small office space, uh, and it's part of the the bounding box, and it sits within the bounding box. Um, yes, so right, so let's focus again on the external. Now that we have the external elements. Um, we need to do, of course, the uh, the bounding box operation filtering, which gives us from you know the whole per perimeter, let's say, of the curtain wall, that particular the western, let's say, uh, facade that we're interested in exploring. And once we have that, we can use this very useful component, which is called analyze curtain wall, which will give us eventually the actual grid. Now, the as we said, the the ultimate goal is to to be able to extract that surface that we're going to use as our um, opening. Um, first of all, a glazing surface, of, and we're going to perform the radiation analysis, and also that opening for the daylight uh, simulation. Right Now, with this uh, curtain wall, from the curtain wall grid, we can actually analyze that further. And that gives us, as you can see, like outputs like the actual cells, the mullions, the, the panels, um, but also additional, like let's say, uh, uh, geometrical um, elements. Now, in this particular exercise, we're interested in this top three, let's say the cells, the mullions, and the actual panels. Um, let's look at the panels first. So from the panels, we can uh, drop the, the, we can use the component, which is called analyze panel. And from this one, you can see that we have all the different uh, panel types. And in this particular project, there are, uh, let's say, three different types of panels. There are the, oh, by the way, I'm um, not sure if I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the Herman Miller Factory, now the Bath School of Arts, is a grade two listed building in the UK. Um, so obviously one of the challenges was 
to identify which of the uh, FRP panels can be maintained, which can be replaced. So you can see here that there, there's there's already um, a way to to categorize, let's say, the existing um, uh, panels that can be kept and the ones that have to be replaced, uh, whether these are uh, FRP panels or glazed panels. Um, so we just want to make sure that from the different types of panels, we just uh, focus on, on these uh, particular uh, types, um, on, on, on this particular type. Uh, again, standard grasshopper operation from this list of types we have, we just uh, use, we create a, a set, let's say of the unique values. And then you can actually see that we have identified that uh, top uh, category, uh, sorry, the top uh, type that we're gonna be using. Um, and then, Natalia, if you just want to move a bit on the right, the next step. There are two things here. The first one is to create a type filter, because now we have uh, identified the type. And of course, the other one is a bounding box. But in this particular bounding box condition, we want to make sure that we have a strict um, uh, encompassing, let's say, uh, condition of the elements that we are after with regards to the boundary box. So in this time, the, the, that input is set to true, right? So we're after the, the panels that are of the type um, uh, solid or uh, glazing units to be replaced. So um, we have this logical end uh, condition um, filtering, and then Ultimately, we want to be using, like, so the actual elements we'll be pulling. Yes, so that, this is, the, this is the filter, we have the filter. The actual elements are the panels, uh, sorry, the, 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 the cells. cells, the cells um, of our uh, curtain grid. Um, now from this, um, again, as we said, this filtering always gives us a, uh, a list of true or false uh, statements, right? Whether actually the elements have passed or not. Um, and therefore, from this um, calling pattern function, we can actually get the curtain uh, grid cells that are uh, relevant, let's say, for uh, our exercise. Right, so if you just select, yes, exactly. So this is exactly, this is the actual glazing panel that provides uh, natural light to the room that we want to perform the daylight analysis to. And of course, the final step is just to create a surface, a grasshopper surface, if you want to mine a surface, uh, which will be used in our uh, simulation. Um, so we already have our analytical surface uh, for um, the floor. We have the uh, glaze surface. What we want now is to complete the exercise uh, by uh, actually uh, getting uh, uh, the context, right? <clears throat> so if we go back to that filtering um, that we did uh, to our um, uh, um, curtain wall with regards to um, which of these actually were part of that initial category, um, again, with the very standard uh, grasshopper sort of <clears throat> practice, the inverted result, so those that have actually failed to pass the initial filter, will be the panels that we are after. And also, uh, the not only the solid panels, but actually uh, uh, the emollients as well, etc. So, we just... Um, Natalia, if you can just uh, move a bit. Yes, right there. Right, so um, what we are after here is two, uh, two, two things, right? Um, the first one is to be able to eventually get uh, the uh, solid panels, and the other one is to get to the uh, actual uh, volumes. Um, by, and ultimately being able to perform that uh, solid operation, that solid intersection, let's say, of these geometries with the bounded box. So in order to do that, we use, um, we choose, let's say, the elements that have passed uh, from the previous uh, operation. 
Um, and yes, and the actual mullions that we got from the initial uh, analysis of our curtain wall system. And, uh, but just, um, yeah, as we always said standard practice, just by cleaning our tube, make sure we don't have any valid objects. We perform that final geometrical operation. So this is, again, the point where we kind of drop the whole um, uh, intelligence, let's say, of our elements and with our uh, metadata that they carry and they become actual geometry, like standard B-reps. And we can identify the, uh, the, the parts of, um, our curtain wall that will be used as actual context for the simulation. Um, yes. Uh, this final step is to actually be able to identify that, as we said, that interior curtain wall uh, that actually has the, the, the entrance, let's say to the room, the door, and that additional panel, um, which we will uh, consider as a solid panel, actually, for the purposes of the daylight uh, simulation. Um, yeah, so with this, we actually have a series of, uh, yeah, sorry, the, might be a bit of luck. Um, the final step is, of course, to do always that solid intersection of the geometries with uh, the bounding box. Right, so with this, we should actually have in the end um, the geometries that we want. So this is, uh, these are the, uh, the walls, the interior walls, let's say, with the floor and the ceiling, and also the, the part of the kernel wall, uh, the solid bit and the mullions. Uh, and also that, um, if, we remember, if you remember, we had before our glazed uh, surface there. So with this, we are ready, ready to, to, to move to the next step, which is the actual um, analysis. So, Obviously, this is a live connection, right? So uh, to, to our Revit model. So any changes that we are doing in, in the Revit model, uh, of course, they get instantly uh, translated uh, within this uh, definition in, uh, in Grasshopper. And therefore, they could be used uh, to uh, get to, to actually evaluate the different results we will be getting from the environment analysis. Um, yeah, so with that, I think I'll, I'll just pass uh, to Natalia, where she can uh, talk to us about the actual uh, environmental analysis bit and um, a few, uh, let's say, uh, more details about how we can start preparing this output in order to bring it inside Unity. And we can already start introducing uh, some uh, elements that are very useful uh, when we uh, talk about reflect, the uh, unity reflect. Okay. Great, okay. Um, yeah, so I would just very quickly take you through the uh, radiation and, and daylight analysis. Um, we are using Ladybug sort of legacy, but um, the 1.2 will be more than appropriate as well. Um, so first of all, we are importing the EPW file. So we can do that. Uh, we, we already have a link here, but if we just type ladybug um, download EPW. Um, oh, that's interesting. A bit of a freeze here. Great, we're back. Um, then, um, that will take you to a web page um, where you can find uh, your location um, for radiation analysis. So in our case is Bath. Uh, so the closest file available is Bristol. So we can copy this link to the clipboard and sort of paste it back here. Um, and then this component of Ladybug will uh, sort of unpack um, the EPW from the link. Um, and then uh, we want to generate cumulative sky matrix uh, for that location. Um, so we need to ensure that run it is set to true. So that's just happening now. Great. 
has completed. Um, and from here, we are extracting uh, the cumulative sky matrix uh, and we are adding an analysis period. So I'll just quickly jump to step four where we can set input time, day and hour. So we can either run the simulation for the full year or for one day. So in this case, we are basically running it for the 21st of June uh, between 5 a.m. and 11 p.m. Uh, but that can be reset to anything we would like to to be reset. And then the radiation analysis is literally next step. So it seems like it has been already switched on. Sorry about that. Let me just turn it off so that we can do it again um, and see the results sort of showing up. Uh, so yeah, so um, when we run radiation here, um, the radiation analysis um, takes uh, the input uh, the, the context the input geometry which was our glazed surface because we are that's that's what we are interested in so basically we've done all this work here extracting a single surface so that uh, it's it's easier to um, carry out environmental analysis whether it's daylight or radiation because if we have a glaze assembly um, then it becomes problematic um, to understand the properties of glazing and also the sort of complex geometry of that assembly might cause um, performance issues while uh, carrying out the analysis so we always want to extract a single surface so that's why we went sort of all the way into this analyzed grid, um, other analyzed curtain grid cell um, set of components to get that clean geometry for, for glazing. And that becomes our input geometry. Input context is basically for this um, exercise, just to, just to showcase it, it's just the piece of um, facade at the front that we sort of cut out using our, um, our bounding box. Uh, but of course, in real life, that would be actual um, shading associated with uh, the part of glazing that we are looking at. Um, and yeah, just wider, wider sort of building context as well, but we just want to um, carry out a really rapid analysis. So these are the inputs here. Grid size, very important. That's just dependent on how big your model is and um, um, what sort of resolution you require. So at the moment it's set to one, so it's very coarse. Uh, the smaller it is, the more, um, uh, the, more, the more accurate the analysis is, but also the longer it takes to run it. Um, so here we've got only just a distance from the base, um, which is important always to offset uh, your analytical surface from the base. Uh, first of all, for radiance to run correctly, well, um, or or for yeah, for 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 the radiation as to run correctly, but also so that the results as they are displayed don't overlap with uh, other um, other surfaces that we might be viewing within the um, reflect. Um, and then yes, we, we just connect the selected um, sky matrix and we run the analysis. And this is our output. So it's just very simple because we've got the same value for every cell of the uh, of the of the uh, grid that got created here. Um, so we know that uh, we, we have sort of approximately two kilowatt hours per meter square for the analytical period. And um, so importantly for the reflect workflow, um, what we want to do is to, uh, we, we need our um, geometry and our outputs to be present in Rhino, not Grasshopper. At the moment, that's how Reflect is working. We need to have baked geometries within Rhino to be able to push them to Reflect. Um, and also, if we want to have any additional um, data associated with the geometry that we are pushing, we need to um, add uh, parameters to that geometry. Um, so that's what we do here, um, sort of um, using using Grasshopper uh, workflow. We can also just bake the geometry and assign the parameters manually. But um, so in this case, we've got we've got sort of two options. Uh, one is straight away bake textured mesh, and and if you want, you can save them up texture file as well. Um, so that's um, that you, you can do that here. So if we if we um, um, change this to true, we can see that we now have a baked mesh. Um, 
that is that that also has the texture, uh, the analysis texture baked in within its material, which is very important for Reflect, because again, Reflect will understand Rhino materials with sort of mapped textures, um, not necessarily sort of um, colors associated with um, uh, with with shaded. Um, preview in layers. So it has to be a material uh, for Reflect to be able to read it. Um, so yeah, that's that's that, that's the ladybug component that we use to sort of bake it off the shelf. Um, the second way of uh, bringing uh, this information into Reflect would be to create, of course, that we, we, we create data points when we do the analysis. So here, the outputs are not just analysis mesh, or I mean, there, there's the radiation mesh that we've used as our output um, to then uh, input into the texture maker. But the other outputs are test points um, and radiation results. So often to be able to display that information in an alternative way within Reflect, we would just want to know the position of the points and know the radiation results. And then we can do all different things within reflect using that knowledge. Um, so if we don't want to just bring in the mesh, but we want to bring in data points uh, to then uh, use for, for example, dashboard um, um, sort of uh, analytics or uh, yeah, for displaying particle system, which we'll show you later, um, we, we, yeah, we, we might want to bring the data in in different formats. So um, importantly, reflect does not support points uh it, it has to get a mesh so for this reason basically we're taking the we are taking the um the, the points as uh, centers of the spheres and uh, we are creating spheres of a given radius this can be any geometry it can be quads it can be you know more complex geometries it can be also just pieces of mesh that are subdivided using a grid um, but we just wanted to sort of um, showcase that you can you can simply uh, you know um, bring the points by choosing uh, a geometry that will that will have um, that point data associated with it. Um, and then um, here we are basically evaluating the uh, uh, the radiation mesh um, using the test points. Um, and then we want to uh, find the color at the test point uh, of the mesh. And we, and we uh, use that to create materials uh, for those spheres. So every sphere will basically have a material uh, based on a color um, that uh, is present in, uh, in, in the test point of um, of the mesh associated with the center of the sphere, if that makes sense. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, so here we bring that color into the material, but we also want to bring the data associated with the ra radiation result. So we just graphed it because we want to be able to sort of um, bring in a, a parameter per sphere. Um, and but but we can also we can also bring in multiple parameters per mesh if we want to. In this case, we just we just uh, bring in one that is called uh, rad. Um, so here we just create um, a list uh, of keys, and uh, that is as long as the list of results. Um, and here we create a list of names that is also. Uh, as long as the list of results, just in case we wanted to identify our spheres later. Um, and here we are using the elephant component to um, sort of uh, bring those attributes and the materials together and bake them together with the geometry uh, into our Rhino um, file. So if I, if I press uh, true here on bake spheres, we can see that we've got spheres baked now. And if I go to Rhino and look at the parameters of the sphere, you can see that we've got rad and a value. So uh, because they've, they've got all the same values, they, they display the same, but if the radiation values were different, this, this would also change here. 
and this can then be pushed. Uh, th this then, as it's pushed to reflect, um, becomes sort of metadata uh, that you will be able to preview in Unity. Um, okay, so that's the radiation. And Natalia, just a second, like, uh, thanks for that. Uh, like, um, just to clarify there, and shout out to Front for uh, Elephant, because we're using Elephant as like it has this very useful. Uh, functionality, let's say there, that allows us to actually create and make those attributes. Uh, in Absolutely, the yeah, it's great. And also the uh, texture maker, which is, I guess it's, uh, it's a typical example of how great people contribute to the open source community of uh, Ryan and Grasshopper, um, where, you know, I, th I think it's, this has been one of the more popular, let's say, a uh, little, uh, um, functionality groups that are available uh, for people. So yeah, again, uh, just make sure we give credits uh, to like everybody who contributes uh, and helps us basically improve our workflows. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so just one thing on the parameters, uh, as we said, we're using Elephant to do it, um, to do it parametrically, but you can also just do it manually um, if you need it to for any reason. Um, so you know you can you can sort of uh, bake the bake the meshes uh, manually and, and assign the parameters, but it's of course not not the point uh, in in ninety nine percent of the cases, but it just can be done. Um, okay, so let me just turn off the, all of these off. Um, and now daylight daylight works on a very similar basis. Um, so here we've got. Um, let me just maybe. Turn these layers off so that you don't see them. Um, so here we've got our input analysis geometry. So um, as, as Jorgos uh, said before, we've sort of separated the upper surface of uh, that piece that we've cut out from the floor. Um, and, and, and we know that the normal of it will be sort of pointing upwards, but that can be checked and also adjusted manually. So this piece is actually larger than what we want. Uh, but, you know, this is just to display how we can all do it sort of um, parametrically. You can also create manual analytic spaces and, and, and check them properly, but um, or, or use uh, the internal walls to cut it further. We haven't done that in this case, but you know, uh, please feel free to play with it. Um, input glazing is that surface that we've discussed many times. Uh, and the input context is basically that shell that we managed to extract um, earlier. So here, our grid size is slightly smaller. Um, in terms of daylight components, I won't be going through them in loads of detail because I think uh, most people will be aware of how it works. Um, we are just creating glazed surfaces and, um, and solid surfaces. Um, for glazed ones, we are assigning glazed material. Um, then we are generating test points using, using that imp uh, input um, geometry. Um, I think importantly, uh, I don't know if I've got those links here. Yeah, importantly, uh, because we are uh, dealing with such large uh, geometries normally when we'll be bringing things from Revit. I think it's very useful to sort of familiarize ourselves with radiance a bit and just in terms of the parameters, uh, the bespoke parameters for running radiance, it's very good practice to um, try and uh, adjust them so that they will um, the, 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 they will work with the size of the analysis that you are running because otherwise you might Get your file running for days and still not have it, and not 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 completed the um, simulation. So this is this is a good resource that sort of gives you a a, a shortcut um, into yeah what what sort of parameters you might want to use. Uh, there is also a radiance primer that will also include in that grasshopper file. Um, so it's, I think it, it's good to it's good to take a look. At these and and you can connect them here as a string. Um, I think we haven't done that because our ana analysis surface is so small that it's not a problem. And then we run the daylight simulation. So it takes the HB HB objects, honeybee objects, which is the context and the glazing, um, as well as uh, the recipe, uh, the analysis analysis recipe 
which um, which uses those test points generated um, on top of that uh, analysis surface. Um, and yeah, we can we can add additional settings, but here we just um, sort of connected the um, the Boolean to go the right radiation run. Um, sorry, right uh, and run radiance components. Um, and then, um, yeah, we want to recolor the mesh using, uh, so recolor the analysis mesh using the results that we obtain from the daylight uh, simulation. So if we run that, it might actually take a little while. We should see the results fairly soon. I don't know if there is any question in the chat that I'm not picking up because I can't see the chat. No, no. Uh, yeah, guys, we we'll try to be very responsive here on the chat. So great, if you have any questions, yeah, hit us up. Great. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, so we've got the colored mesh. Of course, we can sort of add titles and everything here in the um, in the legend parameters component, and then we very much do. The same thing we did for radiation when it comes to creating those spheres and um, and and assigning attributes uh, to them um, using uh, using the attributes component. Um, so let me just bake it so that you can see both the texture, which is coming from the um, from the texture maker. Uh, by the way, uh... and the spheres. Natalia, where you're doing this, I guess uh, we could say, I mean, there's a question just about it. The, the spheres is an indicative geometry that you're using, right? That's perfect. Like you could, there's no particular reason. We just need some sort of geometry to be able to pass it through reflect because reflect requires geometry right? and um, in order to, to be able to get, uh, you know, uh, to be able to pass information, let's say. Yeah, uh, otherwise all you get is a bounding box. You don't actually get any sort of game object within Unity. Um, so so it's important to have a mesh. Yeah, so I mean, I'm pretty sure there are a lot more accurate ways of like, you could actually uh, somehow like, uh, you could very easily in a way send the, 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 the faces as separate uh, meshes, if you want to be more accurate, let's say, and be closer to the actual uh, analytical mesh that you're getting as an output. Uh, and you can assign the attributes in these meshes. You could, I mean, it's literally just a vehicle. It's a workaround, actually, we have sort of found to be able to still uh, use uh, reflect uh, capability in a way uh, to be sending. Uh, basically yeah. uh, geometry to uh, units yeah okay so so yeah so you can see here that the uh, parameters uh, change so the daylight factor changes on different spheres so that's what will get passed to reflect uh, so yeah i think that's it on the on the environmental um if the environmental is not working um using the file that you've got there um uh, let us know and we'll make sure that the a most up-to-date version is uploaded, um, but it should be all fine. So I don't know, Yorgos, do you want to share your screen? Um, um, yeah. Go um, through the reflect yeah, yeah. pushing Push. from Push. Revit. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, by the way, uh, if you just want to unmute yourselves and just ask us, if I can please feel free to um, or use the chat. Uh, if there aren't any uh, immediate questions, we probably continue with the reflect part. Hey, this is Ben from yes. of course the um, awesome, awesome stuff so far. Uh, I was I was really impressed with all the grasshopper add-ins like that, that you mentioned and uh, like you know ladybug, elephant, the texture st stuff. Do you have access inside of script components to the Revit namespaces? Like, could you go into a C sharp component and write a little bit of script that um yeah actually do it you can right you can actually get into the you know like the revit class API. library right yeah. yeah so 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 rhino inside does does give you does give you access to it um and it's really nicely um 
um, documented on the web page. I think I think that's sort of going through different sections. So, for example, walls yeah. and curtain walls. Uh, there is there's an excellent section on that, and uh, it will it will sort of give you an insight into what we've done here. Uh, but also it will give you uh, the details of Revit API uh, that is relevant um, to those components. Yeah, I think there's even a, a sort of tutorial on how to set up your own C Sharp script. So the next time you use it, you have like a, a template of the Revit C Sharp script. So by default, we'll have all the imports for Revit API. So it's all on the Rhino Insight um, uh, website. I think a general comment on that is that obviously uh... I mean, McNeil's contribution to that has been huge in terms of providing, uh, you know, uh, guidelines in terms of how they would envision how we want we would be using uh, the right hand side functionality. Um, I think, as you seen, said, it's a work in progress, right? I think content just gets yeah. uh, filled in by by, by the week, uh, so it's always good to go back and check what what are the new goodies. Um, we, it's also worth mentioning that they, there is a release of Rhino inside every uh, few uh, yeah. months. So again, um, we, yeah, we just need to make sure that we, we stay on top of that. Um, it, it, at Grinch at the moment, Rhino inside has been, you know, it's been uh, quite popular, let's say, um, just because of like this uh, really useful functionality, even with simple stuff, um, like what we showed. Uh, being able to extract uh, geometries like from uh, different categories, but also like for also for the the, the, the beam team, let's say, uh, and in terms of like uh, the the coordination side of things. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we're just uh, hoping that we'll be getting more and more on that side. Yeah, it's super uh -huh. cool. I mean, I, I was curious about the Revit API stuff. I thought the answer was yes because like all the I, I've always found the logical filtering and using Grasshopper components to be a little fussy. Mm -hmm. Whereas like link queries on the Revit uh, a, uh, API is, you can do a lot of filter stuff uh, in there. The other question I had for you all is, I think you just brought it up. Like this is, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but this some of this seem uh, is pretty specific to this project. Um, it, it, it's super awesome, but like, have, do, have you seen a lot of traction with being able to like write little tools or little scripts and People being able to reuse them in Revit, or is it always like the fussy? Oh, this project's different than that one kind of game. No, I we've got we've got quite. Sorry, should I sorry, go? Sorry, no. I was, I was gonna say sorry. I was gonna say one thing, and then yes, and Natalia, <laughs> there is. We've been having that discussion, as in like how, like how good, uh, how much of best practices is, does this model actually have? Like, what's the percentage of yeah. best practice? And actually, you know, we came to the conclusion that the beam team is pretty low. Uh, but we were also wondering, like, for the majority of people, I mean, obviously, we don't want to be there, but on a day to day basis, they probably deal with models that look more like this rather than these exemplar models that we all want to be developing. So this is like a more of a real life, let's say, scenario where this is landed in front of you and you just, you know, you want to do something interesting with it. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, and then I think Natalia, you can just talk about like the, the other yeah. side of things, the more hopeful one. Yeah, I think I think we we do actually have a set of um, of of standardized scripts that use Rhino inside. Uh, first of all, for bringing different types of geometry, and as you've seen, without cutting it. Yep. Um, but also when creating families, um, the, there is there is a sort of a massive set of components uh, associated with that, and that allows the teams. To create more or less, mostly you know, not very parametric uh, families, but maybe sort of complex geometry with different parameters. Um, we can we can do that. So we've got a, um, a standard set of scripts for that, and also for material translation, for example. So now you know there is also a great set of components associated with that. So Revit to Rhino materials are also. Um, you know, they, they never translate very well, but you can do it using Rhino Insight. Um, so I think these are examples of how you yeah, really can use it. Uh, you know, um, yeah, you can you can create templates. Um, it doesn't have to be very project specific, but it's mix and match as always. Yeah, really cool. I have a thousand more questions, but um, you have great stuff. Please Thank go you. ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, mostly like Bert, I don't know. 
we struggle with versioning at TT, you know, like, you know, if we release a new tool, either a, a, a plugin for Revit or a Grasshopper script that we think other people can use, um, like versioning that script and then versioning the libraries behind it. And I imagine there's some struggles like navigating between that and Revit standards, which you were mentioning, Jorgos, like some models are cleaner than others. So I don't know. That's a whole, that's a whole other thing, but um, really exciting. It, it's so cool to see how you all are uh, going after it. And I'm sure it is week by week. That's how it is with us. Everything changes. Um, I think uh, the, on that comment, uh, Benjamin, I think what's it, what has been really useful is that uh, there is now a clear, very strong focus, let's say, because as they sort of explained here, design technology at Grimshaw, and I guess it, that makes sense for a lot of other places as well. Um, we have these two pillars, like there's uh, the computational design and BIM. And um, uh, in the past, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, cases where we would be almost working in isolation, right? And now, like with yeah. the right inside technology, we have a perfect overlap, let's say, where actually we we join forces and there's um, real opportunity to be resolving issues uh, together. So the the whole coordination of a model, which is traditionally taken by our BIM coordinator, suddenly has become a task which we can meaningfully contribute to um, in a very straightforward manner without us having to develop functionality from scratch, right? which is yeah. what we do in, in the past. Um, so hopefully we, Yes, there is efficiency in resolving some of these issues of versioning and, you know, making sure that everybody here is like using the same piece of tech, let's say, uh, and there's a consistent approach in projects. Um, just because of the fact that now we have, you know, we have somewhere to focus. Uh, yeah. That, that has been, I think, one of the, the major, sort of, let's say, changes in the, in the mindset. Uh, we've seen over the past, uh, like, let's say, a few years, the couple of years that actually the inside is available. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Great stuff, you all. So uh, we'll just continue now with the sort of vanilla kind of off-the-shelf reflect product that one could get access to with a, you know, with the license that you already have, with a simple license actually, there, which is called Unity Reflect Review. Um, Share my screen. So uh, Unity Reflect, as we said, it has um, it's effectively this technology that allows us very efficiently to uh, send geometry basically from different platforms, and um, they are increasing as far as we've understood from conversations we've had with uh, with Unity in the past few uh, weeks. Let's say uh, they're increasing. Let's say the, the clients they will be supporting. Um, we will be looking today, of course, at Revit and Revit and Rhino, but uh, there are clients already for other platforms, um, like SketchUp, for example, et cetera. Here at Grimshop, we, we fundamentally use Rhino and Revit, and also the Bentley side uh, as well from some of our other BIM projects. Um, so yeah, you have basically the capacity to, to send geometry on Reflect. Um, so let's say this is, do you all see my screen? Do you all see Revit? Yeah, yeah? okay, good. So if you have uh, received our link and you have successfully installed uh, the Unity Reflect uh, client, you should be able to see it here on Revit. Um, you should see like these three buttons. So the first one, I'm gonna go with this one first one, it's called Reflect, you just click on it. And that actually prompts the uh, Reflect dashboard. So through here, you have access to your account, um, so as I said, you should have set up already an account with our uh, organization that we have set up particularly for this, uh, specifically for this uh, workshop. It's called AEC Workshop uh, Organization uh, on the Unity side. And through here, basically I have access to the projects uh, uh, that I already have on my dashboard or I can actually create new ones. Um, hey, you're also interrupt. Uh, I think yes. you're just sharing the, the, Ryan, the Revit window. Oh, it's on your screen. We can see the reflect. So sorry about that. It's a standard 2020.1 issue. Right, do you, you should be able now to see the reflect window, right? All, all good. 
Great. Right, so, okay, so that's the, the Unity Reflect dashboard. It's from that if you click on here, um, you can see the projects uh, uh, you have there. Um, now, it's quite straightforward in order to export, like, yeah, to export a project. Um, just literally go to to export. Um, you know, try to do it now here live, and it should work. That's the whole point. Three different, let's say, locations. So one is local, you have it in your local machine, you can have it over your network, or you can have it on the cloud. Um, uh, something to mention here, um, off the shelf, Unity have their own uh, uh, cloud service that basically they host the, uh, these models that you will be pushing. Um, but they also uh, provide alternative solutions. So this is something um, for us, for example, which is quite important at Grim Grimshaw. We tend to work with a lot of projects that have very specific uh, confidentiality agreements and uh, very particular agreements in terms of information share. So the fact that you can actually uh, host it on your own servers is something very useful. Um, but off the shelf, just bear in mind with regards to what you will be testing and what you'll be playing with, uh, this goes to Unity's uh, servers. Uh, so you can create here a new project, sign the name, uh, it's a workshop. Uh, that's me. Day two. And from here you can select the organization that you want to push it to. Um, I'm going to select this one, that, as I said, we have established with workshop. Um, this is an important step, I think. Um, Based on yesterday's, I think, sort of feedback, we, we kind of saw that a lot of people have missed that. When you activate your Reflect license, by default, you get your own organization in Unity. And it should have, uh, like, the name of it should be, uh, you know, somehow linked to the names you've provided uh, when you did the sign up. So make sure you select the, the correct organization uh, if you want to, yeah, to push it there. So I'm just going to create it now. So now the project is created and I can just uh, come here and click export. And be able to push it. It worked yesterday, so it's gonna work today as well. Uh-huh, okay. To see, interesting. Beauties of live demo. So now you can see that it's actually exporting. And I mean, in terms of speed, we can say, I mean, you see it just takes like a couple of minutes for, it, for a model of that sort of complexity. I mean, you can imagine if you're pushing like a really heavy model, it might take a bit longer. Um, But what have we, we've been looking, I mean, with the experience we've had so far, um, we've seen that it, like Reflect can really handle, it seems that they can deliver what they promise, which is like to, to, to actually handle a lot of geometry. Um, and I, I'm sure like in the next session, we will be able to talk much more about what it means to be bringing geometry from our standard AC platforms to Unity, which been, has been like a whole grail. Uh, of people, you know, uh, developers uh, in AC with regards to Unity, and we've seen lots of attempts in the past. I'm sure many of you might have already tried something yourselves. Um, but actually, yeah, we're happy to see that there is a solution from Unity. So they actually tell us how they want 
uh, you know, the, our geometry to live uh, within their environment. Um, okay, so now it's it's actually pushed. If I go back to reflect, um, you can see it here. So off the shelf, I can already come here and open it. And that will actually start the uh, unity reflect review. No, it's this uh, standalone app. Right, so this is the environment. And in a second, you'll see that it will start loading the uh, geometries. Okay, so you can see it has already started. When, while the geometries are loading, you can see that we get this uh, blue bounding boxes that are placeholders. So we already know where to expect that our geometry will start appearing. And you know, give it a bit of time as it actually downloads all the geometry from the cloud. Um, and you can see it already starts to build you know, our, the elements that we have already sent. Um, uh, hey, Jorgos, if you maximize that window, we can, can see also the process going forward with the streaming. Yeah, so I think it's almost done now. Yeah, it's getting there. Um, so while this is loading, we can start seeing a few of the, the basic functionality that they uh, give us here. Uh, on the left, I can see a menu where I have access to all the different elements uh, from categories, uh, families, like uh, all sorts of you know, any types of elements that you have in your uh, Revit model. Like in this case, for example, this is a Revit model. Uh, so I can control visibility from here, switch on and off. Uh, the the next uh, tab here and just gives you a, a sort of option if you want to see textures or not. And again, this is, this has to do with how your Revit model actually is being set up and if you have proper materials set up, etc. Um, and the final one here is, I mean, you can control the the, the light, right? let's say the time, the day, um, the, and the hour, the, the, you know, the hour, and you can actually see what uh, they have a you know, a sun system, typical sun system. Um, now you can already see Paris here. So Reflect allows to have obviously a collaborative, this is a collaborative environment, right? So if people have an account and they have access to your organization, then you can invite them and you can host sessions here. Uh, so I can see Paris avatar, I can actually, um, you can, you can uh, follow an avatar. So this is very useful for, let's say, client demonstration. So you can have, uh, or like, I don't know, uh, other sort of stakeholders involved. Uh, you can have them, you can always give them like a guided tour if you want in this virtual environment, which is some sort of cool feature. Um, so, um, of course, you know, I can see this is standard kind of fly around uh, mode. Um, as you can imagine and expect, there is a, a walk. A mode, which if you're familiar with any sort of VR headsets or that type of functionality, you just drop yourself into position and then you're, you're good to go, you're good to navigate. Right click, I can just move my head. And when I'm in walk mode, it means that, you know, uh, uh, the sort of gravity is enabled, which means I can interact with uh, floors and climb stairs, um, open doors, go through windows, etc. cetera. Um, and something which is not, of, I mean, if I have a headset, a VR headset, and we're going to see in the, in the next session, we have uh, here actually our HTC Vive, so we'll be able to see a demonstration of Paris uh, from Paris actually um, in terms of how to have a VR experience. If I have a headset plugged in into my uh, machine, I can already create uh, jump into a VR experience, and then if I have um, Unity Reflect installed. Uh, in uh, my tablet or phone. So there is an app, you can actually download it. And now with your trial license, you can test it yourselves. There's an, um, an AR ready enabled uh, version in which you can have your model in AR, right? So again, this is quite a useful feature. If you're in a meeting, for example, you can just bring the model to the table, have a look around. Um, you can also have, uh, I don't know if you can see here, there's a mic. It means that you can actually hold a conference um, call in here. So the aim, and again, having some conversations with uh, Unity, um, the aim is for this to become more of a, uh, an actual communication, collaboration, coordination, if you want to. Um, 
as it moves in the, you know, into the future. Um, one important, probably most important feature here is that if you select, uh, if you activate this button here, you can actually select uh, elements in the project. And it gives you not only, as you mentioned, the geometry, but all the metadata, right? All the metadata that comes from Revit. And I guess that has been the main, uh, given the USB font reflect, that it keeps all the information um, that uh, one has decided to include in their model. And this is where the whole argument comes into play of like, okay, this is reflect review, and this is the off the shelf product. But if you get access to Unity and reflect developer, which are actually the license we have provided uh, for you for this workshop, then you can pick all that information inside Unity. And then suddenly you have, you know, your hands of very, some pretty powerful uh, data sets uh, that you can start playing with in Unity. So yes, I can choose the different elements. I can see their details. Um, if you were going to ask a question on it, I would just go ahead and answer it before you do that. There is no capability at the moment to actually close the loop and, for example, provide comments here that can come into Revit. This is work in progress. We know uh, that this is coming up very soon. So it's on their public, it's on Unity's public roadmap, but actually it's quite high in the priority list. So it should be available in the next few months, actually. Um, which is an interesting sort of uh, feature. Um, and um, we're really keen to hear your kind of opinions on that, of what it means to close the circle and how much of that functionality you would like to have within this sort of environment. Um, from providing comments to beam elements all the way down to actually tweaking beam elements, which for us, for example, is, uh, it starts to have some question marks, if you want, um, with regards to how useful that, that would be. But again, as I said, we're really keen to hear your opinions on that. Um, so this is the, the, the sort of off the shelf. Uh, I mean, also you can do some uh, quick measurements here. Like uh, again, if that's something you, you would find useful. Um, the, yeah, so as I said, like you can see, uh, so if, by the way, if you have installed Unity and you're part of this organization, uh, so if you've installed Reflex and you've made an account, probably you can join us here so we can see you flying around. Um, or technically speaking, we could continue that session actually in here. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I don't know, sorry, am I forgetting anything about the standard functionality? Um, uh, so I, I think not. You're, you covered most of it. Uh, I think yeah. like that, that's that, the main the main thing to mention here uh, that, that we we will be going through and like it has been mentioned before. It's the the big work that Unity that the Unity team has done on you know like transferring all these like Revit geometries into Unity. Um, I, mean, I mean that was uh, one of the biggest issue <laughs> when creating. Uh, yeah, go ahead, yours. Sorry, yes, so just remember now, obviously you can see here that this button is deactivated here, which means that there is no sync, there's no live sync. Um, if I activate it from here, it means that any changes that I'm doing here in real time, I will be able to see them in uh, Reflect, in the Reflect environment. That's because uh, Reflect works with uh, deltas, so it doesn't obviously recalculate everything, it just identifies the items that have had some sort of change or any new items have been added. So it's pretty, uh, you know, fast. Let's say uh, process, which means that it can help any um, iterative, if you want, uh, workflows. Um, in terms of like quickly visualizing uh, any changes that are happening within the the any of the AC uh, platforms, you're pushing your designs from to Unity to to reflect. Um, Right, so um, are there any questions so far about Reflect and uh, review? Um, hey, Joe, just, just a quick question. Hi. Um, when you press the export button uh, in Revit, did, did it ask for like any specific category that you want to send or any specific elements? It just exports everything? Just pushes everything. It, yeah. Mm, okay. It pushes yeah. everything. 
Um, and then in reflect, you have the, the ability to visualize the categories that you want or not. But yeah, it pushes everything. Um, which I mean, so, depending on how you see it, like it could be either very useful or, you know, yeah, not that. Yeah. I mean, it could be challenging if the project is really big and we are really interested in only that specific part of the project. So, according to, we haven't tested that ourselves, but according to Unity, they've built post models of oil rigs and, you know, like really complex uh, buildings, let's say, with a lot of componentry. Um, so, it is supposed to be able to handle, and that's the whole idea of. Uh, them investing actually um, time and effort in developing that to hold a really big amount of data and geometry. Um, as I said, we haven't tested that in something really extreme. Um, so we, we, we take the word on that. Um, the interesting thing, uh, and I guess that slowly try to bring us uh, to the, the next session, which is like looking under the hood. Um, the reason why this has happened and is enabled is with the uh, because of Unity's collaboration with uh, Pixies. Right? Pixies is a, a platform that um, has the capacity to handle immense amounts of geometry and optimize geometry. Um, so basically, in the bank background, what we have here is Pixies. Right. So all of our Revit geometry get, goes through Pixies, gets optimized, and then. Uh, it pass, it gets into Unity, right? Um, so I think that's one of the major, let's say, components that allows them to to to, to offer that functionality. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, it, I'm really like really curious to kind of find models like that have really a lot of geometry, especially uh, with some of our bigger infrastructure projects that we're working here, uh, and see yeah, where like if if we, if we can break it. Um, yeah, I guess um, uh, on the Unity side, when you want to put that down all this geometry, there's the, there's a way to uh, always filter that geometry, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And I think that's the part, yeah, that's our next session. Basically, we're going to see exactly how we can uh, process all this geometry. Um, and yeah, how to get access not only to the geometry, but actually to the metadata. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Any sort of like comments? Okay, I'm looking at the chat now. Um, It doesn't, okay. Um, why are you looking at uh, Hamid's comment? You should be able um Hamid comments in my account for chat unity. So Hamid, when you're trying, that's happening through export, right? So when you do export, the first thing to do is make sure you create a project. Once a project, okay, that's uh, something we're going to see in the next session. Once a project it's, it gets created, then you can push from multiple clients to that project. And once you start pushing from uh, different platforms, you can actually get a list of the uh, different, like, let me just go to my like dashboard here. Yeah, so at the moment, I can see uh, that I've pushed on the cloud. Uh, but once in the next session, Paris actually pushes from Rhino as well, the uh, analysis meshes and the spheres that we produce. So you're going to see that you start, and uh, it gives you um, information about what was the platform that was pushed. So you can see Revit, Rhino, et cetera. Uh, the one thing that's missing from here is um, uh, revisions, right? So you just need to be mindful. And uh, we know it's one of the things that like from our side, we would like Unity to see like uh, developing in the future of actually understanding at which point somebody pushed uh, and which version of the model. Um, I guess for now, this is very much um, a tool that allows you to have the, the geometry inside Unity so you can like 
do interesting stuff with their with, with that you know with the, the designs that we have there uh but yeah so uh, seeing us deploying this into a you know a bigger scale in the office uh we would definitely want to to see this uh control over which versions of the model are actually pushed so well i have a quick question when i yeah. want to export via the revit file mm -hmm. and uh when I well and clicked on their exports, there would be an option for create a project. And as you mentioned earlier, there would be some uh, sort of organizational links. Mm -hmm. That's my name would be one of the organization and AEC yeah. workshop would be another option. Exactly. But I cannot see the AEC workshop here. You I checked the only, my, yeah, okay. Yes. Oops. Uh, yes. It, I checked my uh, account and web, I mean, website of Unity. I figured out that I access to the uh, workshop, I mean, AAC workshop. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm one of the member of the organization, mm -hmm. but I cannot see that option when I want to create a project. So do you see only your name under these organizations? Yes. Right. Yes. And you have, okay. And Paris, do you see uh, Hamid in the organization? Uh, I can double check now just to mention that um, because all of you are assigned as users into the workshop organization, you may not be able to create new projects on, uh, on that organization. You can see and use the ones that we already have there. Um, yeah, I'll I'll if we on, just, on. yeah, if we just change them to managers uh, quickly. So, yeah, people can actually create you know, projects there. Uh, but, um, Hamid, are you actually able to see our project, the project that I've created? Uh, well, when you go to your unit you to reflect the typical dashboard, you actually see it there in the list. No, I cannot see the the project in Unity dashboard. Uh, Yorgos, maybe it would be a good time to uh, to start uh, in our break rooms, so people we can you know go to everyone's issue and uh, we can no, share the screen um, because it's already you know we have like ten minutes of um, before the break, so maybe you can start already um, solving some of those issues. So yeah, there is a uh, coffee break as you know, by the schedule for like half an hour. Um, We'll be around if you want if you have any sort of issues any troubleshooting for unity for the next part um if you want yeah you can just uh, take your break now um officially the next session will start at uh, 3 30. so i think everyone should see soon a pop-up uh, on zoom with a uh with a break room right um so you will be able, able to Thanks everybody for uh, joining again for the second part of uh, today's uh, workshop. I see we have some uh, new people that have joined for that uh, second session. Um, good to have you with us. Um, just quickly uh, going to um, repeat what we briefly did in the first part. So we look at uh, our basic case studies the, and the model that we actually shared with you. Um, on G Drive is the uh, Bath School of Arts and Design. And we're using that basically case study to uh, see two, three or three flavors basically of interoperability. Uh, the first one was to uh, uh, get geometry, get basically BIM elements and their metadata from Rhino, uh, from Revit, sorry, to Rhino with uh, Rhino inside. And we used uh, those elements as basic geometry, let's say, to perform uh, some very simple environmental analysis, radiation, and daylight, uh, on a very particular, like a small part of the, of the uh, project for uh, experience and for economy uh, time uh, purposes. Obviously, as we said, uh, free to just experiment uh, with the model and just the, you know, uh, either try to be more radical in terms of like the types of analysis, uh, environmental analysis you would be doing, the accuracy, the, you know, uh, the extent to which you want to apply to the project, the different areas of it. So now, and we also saw uh, Unity Reflect off the shelf, right? So uh, the, the product we just called Unity Reflect Review, 
And I'm just going to quickly uh, share my uh, screen. Let me know when you can see. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so this is the, the, the Revit model that uh, we're looking at. That's the, the, the Bath School of Arts and Design, ex uh, Herman Muller Factory, originally built in 1976 by Grimshaw Architects and then opened a few years ago as this new school, an educational building. Um, so, um, if, as we said, if you had success, successfully installed Unity to reflect um, on the client side, at least you would have a onto Revit, you, uh, you will see this uh, additional plugin uh, with very simple functionality. Reflect itself sends you to the dashboard actually of Reflect. And then through there, you can access the project. This is the, 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 the actual, uh, yeah, this is a project that uh, we're in. And you can see we have a few participants already. Some of you are already in. Um, you can see your avatars here. And um, we say that. Uh, uh, Reflect allows us uh, within this, uh, let's say, uh, this office of uh, tool to select elements in this environment and read all their metadata, change uh, the, the the hour of the sun, etc. You can actually go and if I select somebody here, I can actually follow their camera, so I can see now what Paris is looking at the moment, or I can move to Natalia, right? Uh, so this is quite useful, as we said, because like especially if you have uh, other stakeholders like clients, etc., you can actually have a guided tour. So if Natalia now moves, I'm actually moving with her. Um, so in a way, you know, uh, I can freely explore the project, but I can also uh, I'm also able to uh, to look at exactly what the person who guides the tour actually uh, or the presentation wants me to be able to look at. Um, now, so as we said. This next session will be more about like getting under the hood, uh, going inside Unity and actually seeing how, how Unity Reflect works, how we can access uh, the data uh, that we send through Reflect, then the metadata, and most importantly, how we can start using them to extend the functionality and start building some interesting uh, data visualization inside um, um, Unity. Uh, so I'm um, gonna head over to Paris now and Justina. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, Paris, the floor is yours. Great. So let me share my screen now. Okay. 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 So we're gonna start by going here on the uh, exported uh, radiation analysis. Uh, yeah, as my colleagues saw before, basically. This is the outcome that comes uh, out of the analysis and here I have the basic two layers with the spheres as Natalia was saying before and the actual mass of the um, uh, of the radiation uh, space that we calculated. So um, similar to what Yorgos was, was showing before on the Revit side, um, installing the client of the Unity Reflect also make, makes, the, makes the connection here with Rhino. Uh, so similar to how Revit was doing, I can just type Reflect here. And I can see basically that Unity have added three options to my Rhino um, client here. Okay. Um, three options, um, exactly the same options that we had on Revit. So it's uh, the GUI that is basically an, uh, a window popping up just to see the projects that you have available on Reflect, um, a sync option and ex export option. Um, yes, yeah, someone mentioned before, basically the export is exporting the whole Rhino file, everything that is in here. And that's exactly what I will do. I will hit export here. That would prompt the reflect window to pop up. Yes, so here it is. Okay, so apparently I need to sign in. While Paris signs in, for those that have joined us uh, just for the second part, um, please at any point you can just unmute yourself and ask a question or you can use the chat. Uh, we've been quite active uh, on the chat. If there's an urgent kind of technical uh, query, we can always use one of the breakout rooms to resolve it.
It seems I think we just oh. I think we just crossed out. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Um, is everybody back? I think Zoom just crashed there for a second. And um, also, again, for those that uh, join us now for the second session, uh, just to explain uh, briefly what um, uh, what we saw in, in the last in, in the first part um, reflects, as we uh, said before, uh, requires works with geometry basically. So you need some sort of geometrical inputs to be able to, to, to pass information. So what we've done there with the analysis, um, with the analysis mesh that we got from um, uh, our radiation and daylight analysis, we actually uh, have created these little uh, geometry placeholders, these spheres, um, at each of the data points that were used for the analysis. And each of these spheres, you know, if you can just for a second select one of these spheres to just to see the attributes, we have actually passed the radiation analysis in this particular example. Um, yeah. Um, so go to the, yeah. the attributes. So we have passed actually the uh, radiation uh, result at this particular data point in each of these spheres, right? Um, so through that, we will send them to reflect and we will um, be able to read them in Unity and uh, continue with our data visualization part. Thank you, Joros, for explaining this. Yeah, so basically uh, the process of uh, baking in these attributes uh, in, onto these spheres representing some da data points of the analysis, um, it's here. So like this is the Rhino file that uh, the actual analysis produced. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to continue with the export here. So again, uh, Reflect has installed base these three basic uh, function uh, buttons here on, on, on Rhino. So I'm going to click export again. This will prompt again this window up. I probably don't have to log in again. Yes, so here we are. And yeah, and if I go to the project that Girls uh, created before, I can see that Girls Security this has pushed the bath blast from Re from uh, Re Revit. So what I'll do now is basically export this model into the Unity Reflect project. And yeah, I can see the connecting to the singing service and I'll get up also a message about the completion. Okay, so I can see the operation has been completed. Um, okay, so I think we're ready to jump on the unity side of things. Sorry for that. So if I go here. Yes, so once you open the Unity project that we uh, have on the design technology repository, and if you have the correct um, uh, licenses and your account is signed in here, um, basically this is the Reflect project as they have it on the Reflect develop. So, yeah, again, just to check on what Joros was saying before, uh, the Reflect develop is basically the, the attempts that Unity did to targeting exactly our industry, our AC, AC industry. And uh, yeah, it's their attempt of this uh, interoperability and intercorporation between uh, different uh, users. Um, I'm gonna quickly explain the Unity interface for those who are not familiar with. Uh, so basically the Unity interface uh, uh, consists of two main windows. This is the scene window uh, up here, and this is the game window. Basically the game window is what we see on the actual application and the scene is similar to our 3D scenes. Uh, basically it's just like every game object that we have. Uh, the higher here in the middle, it's um, a list of all the available game objects that are on the scene right now. Uh, I have the project tab here, that is all the available assets and scripts for files and yeah, pretty much everything that this project is consisted of. 
And here on the right, I have the inspector. The inspector is the basic uh, window to see additional information about each of these game objects. So every time I select something on the, on the hierarchy, I can see the additional information it has on the inspector, on the inspector tab. So um, to quickly explain here on the Unity side what Reflect offers. Uh, so the basic, this is the basic Reflect scene. Um, reflect is using this just one scene. This is the, the main scene of Reflect and have some additive um, scenes for uh, additional features like VR and AR, which is um, uh, just handling more of the controller headset functionality. Uh, on this main scene, we have uh, a few important game objects. So we have like, I'm going to start from the top. So here we have the reflect game object. So if you see here on my spectrum on the right, if I make that bigger actually. So this is the basic pipeline that reflect is using to bring in the geometry and handle the, the import uh, of, yeah, of, of geometries and objects from uh, the different clients. Uh, so as in Revit and Rhino. And they have, they have this pipeline um, assigned um, most of most of the functionality of the pipeline is exposed, uh, although Unity does have some parts um, locked and secured. Um, but most of the functionality is available for the developer to to use and extend upon. Um, going down, we have here the managers that basically handles. Yeah, the login of the details the, for each user plus uh, yeah the the delta DNA which is exactly what George was, was uh, saying before basically handling the uh, differences between each model that you're pushing and how, how this can be connected into the scene and finally they have the link sharing manager which I don't know if we mentioned before but Unity does have uh, Unity Reflect does have a functionality to practically just invite someone into your project using one simple link. Um, again, this will require a Unity Reflect license uh, for that account. But basically, even if you are not part of an organization or for a project, you can share a link and someone can come into the project and yeah, experience the space together. If I keep going down, uh, here we have the placement route. This is the base, uh, the, the main part of all the geometries coming into uh, uh, reflect. Uh, this is where the, all this will be hold, holded. Uh, and here we have the U, UI route, which, yeah, as you can see, this is the basic UI interface. Uh, yeah, the user interface for Reflect. Um, yeah, this this is how the the Unity team has set this up. And again, this is all customizable, and we can yeah extend on top of that. Uh, plus the last one game object down here, which is the multiplayer that handles all the multi-user uh, features that Reflect offers. And lastly, down here, we have our own um, game object that actually extends the Reflect functionality a little bit. So I'm going to run this project once so we can see the uh, analysis data coming in. And then we can go through to actually see the, the way that we uh, read and manipulate the analysis data coming in from Rhino. Let's let this play out. Um, yeah, so I see a comment on the chat uh, saying, uh, how do I open Unity? So we do have a, a file of instructions. Um, if you follow the instructions there, you're gonna need to create a clone to clone the repo that we have there or just download the, the whole zip file and add that onto your Unity hub and editor. Uh, okay, so once this plays out, I can see again, similar to the reflector view, I can see all the projects I have access to and yeah, so the specific one and the users that are in there. So yeah, I can open that now. Yeah, and uh, down here you can see basically the streaming of the actual game objects. This is uh, yeah, like 4,000 game objects coming from Rhino and Revit. Um, it is a process that takes a while, um, not that long. And yeah, as we 
keep said uh, <laughs> keep mentioning <laughs> that basically the, the the big win that the unity team has done uh here it's the the actual uh geometry transfer uh so yeah for example myself as a, an xr developer this is something i have been struggling with <laughs> for quite some time uh actually bringing those huge revit projects into a unity scene that was always a hassle and unity the, the reflect team did actually uh, solve a big part of that pro pro problem so this is taking a while but i can start going closer Yeah, so on the whole question um, about the generic workflow, um, that's an interesting one because um, the official instructions from Unity is really to clone that uh, repository, clone that project based APD on, on that repo. Um, and start building on top of it. However, we have. If, in the we're going to share a video with you that was just shared with us basically uh, last night from unity uh, for those of you that are interested in exploring some of that um in the hackathon <clears throat> where there's actually a package a reflect package that you can bring in your unity project but so if i can explain here a little bit uh, i can see basically like this is the avatars and the names of everyone in the project right now and be below that i can see basically where uh, like a game object that holds all the geometry coming from batspa which is our revit model and our rhino bath uni radiation analysis it's under here so yeah typical unity i can disable the game objects and see only the relevant info or yeah i have access to basically all the uh, all the geometries and all the functionality here um yeah so if i can quickly assign a new texture to this so basically uh what paris is doing now here is just assigning the texture that if you remember in the first session we actually exported from our analysis the mesh texture that natalia showed um, which actually has exactly. the correct, uh, yeah, coloring of the meshes as they were uh, of the mesh as it was produced by our radiation analysis. Yes, and um, Unity Reflect has a, it, it's quite a comprehensive uh, development. So they 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 have included most of the work uh, needed and usually applicable in game engines so it's actually calling uh, the game objects that are not visible by my camera and, uh, and the renderers so yeah this enhances the basically the performance and it's a bit of like an optimization on top of the this game engine basically uh, so we can see the analysis coming in and yeah and I I can click in one of these objects so right here. Okay, so we just selected one of the spheres. So I'm gonna have a quick look here in the inspector to see how this is looking coming from Rhino. So basically, this is just one of the of the spheres. You can see it on the top left here. Uh, this is just a simple me single mess coming from Rhino, uh, and this is how Unity handles the metadata coming with it. Uh, if you see, they created this script, uh, a component that holds the actual metadata coming from Rhino, and that's actually holding layer information, material index, that's something created by, Un by Unity Reflect in order to handle the, yeah, the display on the render. Uh, document information, so this is the actual name of the document that this was um, coming from. And um, yeah, the actual analysis data that was included here um, by the analysis that the, my colleagues showed in the previous session. So I can have like right values and that's this. I can click somewhere else and see another right value. And basically this is the relevant information we need to find out, uh, uh, store and use uh, for, for this analysis. Um, 
Yeah, so I think that is fine. The rest of the functionality here, it's pretty similar to what uh, reflective view and what you also showed before. So I can maybe just stop playing this project and we can go through a little bit of the code and the functionality we have included on top of this uh, reflect uh, to basically handle uh, the reading and storing of this uh, an, uh, data analysis. <clears throat> okay, so basically this is our extension game object uh, in Derp cubed and we have basically two main elements. We have the data handler, which we can go through right now. probably be able to see my Visual Studio now. So, yes, uh, so to go through this, um, again, Unity is a game engine and with, um, like if you have any experience you using C Sharp, uh, this will be pretty straightforward to understand. Um, yeah, this is just a single script that handles uh, the, the import and reading of the data for its game object coming from Rhino. Uh, in order to do that, we have connected um, our functionality to this uh, sync object binding. This is a script component uh, added by Unity Reflect to each game object and basically handles yeah, the syncing within uh, the Unity sync. Uh, so we've, ass we've ass assigned uh, our own custom method on top of uh, the uncreated uh, action that they have there. So if I go to the uncreated, what we do here, it's basically we, um, this is all uh, commented out and uploaded into the uh, drive. So you can have a look at your own time and you can figure it out. Uh, so in here, basically this is one method that fires every time each game object is added to the scene. And for each game object that adds to the scene, we need to basically find this class called metadata, as we showed before, that this is holding our actual analysis data. And if we do have a metadata file, uh, we can go through and iterate through all the assigned uh, parameters that this script has. Um, this is a simple workaround that we did in order to not to do this uh, calculation basically for Revit models and just do this for Rhino. So quick workaround would be to include a simple tag called Rhino on top of the Rhino file name uh, in order for us to iterate through and understand if this is a Rhino file or not. Uh, going through each of the layers, uh, each of the parameters, we need to find a couple of useful information and actually store our um, yeah, our analysis data in the correct way. Uh, this is something that we have communicated through with my colleagues using uh, the Grasshopper before. So if you've seen like the, the actual user string, it's called rad, so I, I, I should be aware of that. Uh, the daylight factor, it's called daylight, and we have also a color factor uh, coming through that custom uh, attributes from Rhino. One, uh, and going through all these parameters of the uh, metadata, component script, I can iterate through. And if I find the relevant rad um, string, I can actually get uh, the value of the radiation. Um, what we do here, it's basically storing all these values into one big list. And while also uh, getting information about the mean and max radiation that we have encountered, similar exact way we do for the daylight factor, we're storing the data, we're storing the value, and we are trying to determine the min and max of this uh, range of values. Uh, in order to handle, uh, as I said, this method is firing for each game object. Um, another quick workaround that we did here was to basically handle uh, stop unity from um, stopping our, our functionality here from running constantly and just wait until all the relevant uh, objects are in the scene. Uh, that's happening through a simple core routine that actually checks if we have finished streaming, streaming all the game objects or not um, in order to yeah, basically trigger the, the actual calculation. Um, in order for this data to be used correctly, what we did was um, we thought about uh, quick way to basically determine based on the user position and actually visualize this data information 
uh, into a more robust manner, if I may. Um, so we used a, a simple dashboard to display all this uh, data, and the data is getting fitted by the closest data point that the user is at. To do that, we have a, a method here that basically returns which is the closest data point that I am based on the user position. The user position is determined by the camera position inside the, the unit yet, the unit scene. And what we do is iterate through all the relevant data points and gets uh, we get a distance between them and figuring out what's the closest distance we can, distance we have uh, for this game object. Once we have the closest distance and the actual target of the, the closest data bone target, we can basically on a fixed update uh, function that runs uh, it's in its frame, basically. Um, we do calculate that closest data point and we assign those values to the data visualization. Um, here is the way that we, cal we are calculating the closest uh, radiation and daylight factor and yeah, all the way down to basically actual display these um, these values into a yeah, visualizing manner. Um, again, this whole code is commented out and available to you, so you can go through it at your own pace. And um, yeah, so if I go back here into the scene, I can quickly show what this script is doing. And then my colleague Justina can jump over to explain a bit more about the data visualization. Okay, Yorgos, have we missed anything here? Wanna add anything? Um, no, no, I think it's it's great and. Um... So as we said, like this is one approach. Like this is how we can uh, thought uh, it would be uh, sort of sen sensible, let's say, to 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 iterate through this. Um, uh, let's say the, the 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 data set we're getting from Reflect and extracting the information we're interested about. Basically, uh, you know, the end goal is to be able to navigate this project, and apart from the spatial qualities and the material fidelity that you're getting from the, the Revit model. On top of that, we get a good understanding of these performative aspects that say the projects, for example, through looking at this radiation analysis. Um, so I'm sure there are all sorts of different ways to actually query like those data points. We thought that the, an easy one to kind of showcase is like, to always get the closest one that's, um, to the closest one to, to the, the, the player that you're exploring in a space. Of course, but, you know, we can think of all sorts of other interesting ways to do that. Um, but the idea is that you, you can um, get a value, you, you can get the value, and I think, and you still will show us in a second how we can do that by applying a dashboard, basically, um, to make really visual. Um, the results that we have gotten from our analysis, and in a way, try to combine that information that we have, the performative aspect of, of the design with the actual, uh, let's say, architectural the design intention. Um, exactly, yeah. And I think like what to stress here is basically the flexibility that this gives. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, Unity engine and I'm actually, you no, know, like any game engine. Uh, this is this is the the big advance and adv advantage that we have here. Uh, basically, bringing all this information and actually, you know, having the ability to, yeah, to to, to use this uh, functionality of this uh, game engine to display and yeah, extend upon our basic Rhino model. Um, there's one question. Yeah, there's, there's one question uh, in the chat about how many people is a typical unit related team. Um, 
so I, I just wanted to like, give one comment here that everything we are showing right now, uh, there is practically like no custom development here. Uh, so what we would like, obviously we did environmental analysis in, in Grasshopper and, but we, we just pushed Rhino model and Revit model. And uh, what we are seeing right now, it's uh, only the default reflect project. So uh, everything that you are uh, getting straight away with uh, like reflect develop and we are just reading the model. So um, in order to comment that it seems like a lot to handle for a single person, um, what we are showing right now, like it's uh, one person is like uh, capable of doing that. Uh, it's all of it, all of, all of we are showing right now. There's no custom development here. So that's what you get by default. Um, so everything that we will do extra or, or we will show now with like a, uh, we'll show like a small data visualization tool. So this is extra, but um, you don't need to do any, uh, you know, specific custom development just to run what we are showing um, here right now. Yeah, I guess apart from that bit that uh, actually, yeah, you need to kind of read the data as they come from reflect. It's the data handler. Uh, yeah, this the is data, one yeah. bit of custom script, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if there's a question about in, in general that the workflows uh, over here, like uh, projects are typically one or two people, three people is max. Um, so, yeah, um, we are at a point where we don't, you know, we don't have at the moment a big a Unity developers team. Um, it's mostly, uh, you know, a skill that the, the people that are either in the city, uh, computational design team or as part of the XR they actually have. Uh, but yeah, there isn't uh, there isn't that dedicated unit uh, within Grimshaw at the moment, uh, just looking into yeah, unit, let's say. Yeah. Yet, as our uh, director of technology, Andy, what's just uh, commented. <laughs> Uh, yeah, basically, again, just to mention here uh, what we did, finding the closest data point, it's actually, uh, we found a quick way to visualize that, uh, just turning us this sphere into a red color. Uh, yeah, we can see here that this is the closest one I have at the moment. And yeah, I can move around and that will update. Ooh. Yeah, so like now it's that closest. Now I'm somewhere far, far away, probably. I guess, the, lagged. I guess the work mode is the, the most useful. I think we got lost. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. That's not behaving great. But uh, yeah, I think it's a good time to give the floor to my colleague Justina and she can talk about the data visualization that we have produced. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah, maybe you can uh, try to play the projects in the meantime again. And I will show you my screen now. Right, so I will talk a bit about um, the data dashboard that we prepared. Um, okay, can you see my screen? <coughs> yeah, great. Uh, so basically, uh, once we imported um, uh, our meshes and our points, this is sort of like the first level of visualization that we're having in the Unity Reflect. And um, just to add a bit on top of it, we decided to make a small prototype with uh, data visualization dashboards. Um, and I think one of the issues that we tried to uh, tackle with the dashboards is um, you know, we're, for every project, we are doing like more and more uh, visualizations and uh, sorry, the, mm, environmental analysis. Um, and basically, uh, you know, if reflects give you this extra functionality of actually walking around, uh, maybe it's a good opportunity to actually give more understanding to environmental analysis results. So once you walk around, you can actually understand, okay, what are the environmental conditions for my current location? Um, so uh, that's what we decided to do. So everything that Paris was talking about, um, about you know this uh, red sphere that was highlighting once he was walking around the uh, around the project. Um, this was his uh, data handler script that was looking for 
the closest uh, data point, um, uh, the closest data point to uh, to the user, right? So we used uh, with that functionality of finding the, this closest data point uh, to actually read the environmental analysis information that is associated to that point and visualize it in the dashboard, right? So rather than, rather than just having that uh, general uh, overall colored mesh that um, Grasshopper is providing us with, uh, we're as well providing information about uh, your current results for your current location. Um, so we believe that it could you know, give a bit extra understanding of, uh, of the analysis. Okay, so um, going to the unity itself, um, the, you have the, you know, in the project hierarchy, you have the UI root object, which is the, the whole UI for the reflect. So basically in the, in the unity reflect, you have um, the, the multiple canvases overlapping with each other. So there is, you know, um, you have a series of like a UI elements here, but if you want to add your own, you just add extra canvas on top and you just develop on, on top of it. So basically I just, you should have it as well. Uh, there will be a, a dashboard canvas and on this dashboard canvas, there is an object, a dashboard. Uh, so this object is a, is a prefab. Um, if you're not familiar with Unity, uh, prefab is sort of an object which is uh, stored in your project folder. So whenever you uh, open, you can use it. So it will be uh, in, your, in your project. Uh, so basically you could say that in Revit, it will be like a family that you can instantiate to your uh, to your uh, project. So it would be sort of like that. In my project folder, I will have the prefabs and I can instantiate them to my scene, right? Um, so I have my uh, dashboard and inside of the dashboard, I have uh, four, uh, uh, four children uh, and each of them is prefab as well. Um, and each of them contains different type of data visualization. So as you can see on the left, those are four uh, different boxes. And this is something that uh, we haven't developed by ourselves. This is coming from the uh, Unity Asset Store. So uh, again, if you're not familiar, the Unity Asset Store is a website with all of different packages that you can get. And um, you know, if you want a very specific, maybe data visualization or anything else, you can obviously develop your own uh, asset, but uh, there is quite a few to choose from for the data visualization. So um, you can get it as well from the Unity store. Um, so uh, this is something that we just, um, you know, just get the asset and you just place data visualization on your canvas. And that's, that's how simple it is. Uh, so actually if I have a few more examples, you know, this, is straight uh, straight from the asset. I haven't modified it at all. So basically, you remember when I was talking about the prefabs. So I have my I have my uh, package, right? I have my assets. I go to prefabs, and I just I don't know. I pick this one, right? And I just paste it on the dashboard. Okay, it's the same one, but never mind. And I can just see. It will be easier. I can just drag, move it around, right? And you know uh, you can change any information associated to the asset. So um, I don't know the color, right? The color of the whole dashboard. So you can modify that as um, as much as you want. Uh, and basically, every every script is um, sorry. Every asset is controlled by uh, by a script. So to every asset we have uh, attached a script that is actually, uh, you know, updating the values uh, on this uh, on this asset. So let's go to let's say we have the first one, which is a percentage of your bucket. So if you can see, if I en enable and disable, this is this one, right? Um, and to this script, uh, to sorry, to this asset, we have uh, assigned script called. Uh, the wave circle, right? So if I double click, click the uh, if I double click the script, it will direct me to the Visual Studio. If you don't have Visual Studio, you can open that in a in text file or in any other editor. And again, as Paris mentioned, uh, the the script that is actually you know updating the, the values uh, is extremely simple. Um, so I think I think in the workshops yes, yesterday I said that 
if, if you know the if you know how to write a loop you're good to go but then you realize we don't even have a loop so i think uh, it might be even more than you need to know uh, to run this script uh, so i'll just quickly uh, tell you uh, about that so once i um, enable the component uh, i'm accessing the data handler so this is what paris was talking about and i'm getting um, and i'm getting the values for this dashboard so again um, this, this is the data handler. I'm accessing function that will get the minimum value. And in this case, like what is the minimum value? If I have the whole environmental analysis, um, I have, you know, I have let's say 100 data points, right? So the minimum value will be the data point with the lowest value. So this should be the lowest number for the uh, daylight. It could be, I know, uh, let's say zero, and the maximum could be 10, let's say, right? So I'm just getting those values. Uh, as an input, I'm giving the data name, and the data name is a uh, uh, is, a, is a field that is actually uh, um, public, uh, and public means that when I'm in my Unity inspector, I can see it here, right? So I typed here, this, this is something that I uh, let you know added, added in the inspector. So I, I, did, uh, I added that uh, daylight, and it will use this information daylight to um, uh, to check the values from the data handler, right? So on the start, I'm getting my minimum, maximum, uh, the average value uh, units. So for the daylight, it will be UDF um, and the current value, right? So the current value was this uh, value of the closest point to the user. And then what I'm doing on the update is um, uh, just checking the current value. So I don't need to check the minimum or the maximum because this will still stay the same, right? So what am I doing is um, on an update, so every frame, uh, I'm getting the local value of the daylight. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not doing any work anymore with this, uh, those um, uh, finding the closest point because everything is uh, done in a data handler. I'm just reading the information here. Um, and yeah, the rest, the rest part is uh, just updating the uh, values in the, uh, in the actual data visualization asset based on my current value, right? So the wave is, uh, is a component in the, uh, uh, is an image that is filling this uh, circle, right? So this is literally saying like how high it should be um, to, to fill this circle. So maybe I can show it. Wait, let's see if it's this one. Yeah, so it is somewhere here, right? So you see, okay. right? So basically, what it's uh, what it's doing is uh, it's checking the value. So if my value is five and the mix, my minimum is zero, maximum is ten, if you realize like okay, this is fifty percent, so my uh, water uh, should be somewhere in the middle. Um, right. Okay. And I think about this trip, it's more or less everything. Uh, yeah, and most of them so for those for for those four assets the scripts look very similar so we won't be going again through uh, all of them uh, but i just quickly mentioned about the uh, about the type of the uh, um, data components that we uh, da database that we decided to visualize and uh, so the first one will be for the daylight analysis and on the left side you will have the actual value of daylight analysis for the closest point of the analysis, right? So uh, I'm walking on the building, uh, the data handler is checking what is the closest point. I'm reading the value of this closest point, right? And this will be the value of the daylight. On the right side, uh, it's percentage in relation to the average daylight, right? So I can, um, let's say my average daylight for the whole analysis will be, let's say it's five, right? And, and I consider this a good daylight, so once I walk around the building, uh, this will give me uh, this will give me the percentage of how close I am to this five, right? So if my current value is ten, so I'm somewhere next to the uh, big glass panel, and this can give me actually uh, you know the value of uh, two hundred percent, or if I'm uh, somewhere close to the you know when I'm in a very dark place and daylight is zero point three, this will be like a five percent. Right, so it's in the relation to the um, to the average daylight. However, you can do it. You know, this is just this one function uh, in the 
in the Visual Studio that is, uh, that is calculating that. So you can do whatever you want. You can do it, you know, my minimum, my 0% is a minimum value, my maximum percent is a, um, uh, is a maximum value, and then your percent is somewhere in the middle. Uh, okay, the second analysis, yeah, this will be the radiation. So this is the second analysis that we had on the, on the panels. Uh, then the third uh, component is the uh, glazing ratio. Uh, and this is a component that um, you know, just have a, uh, if you go to inspector, if you select this glazing ratio and go to your inspector, you will see the free script, the 3%. So this is a, a script attached to it. And um, this just have exposed values of the solid panel fund and the glass panel fund. Uh, so if I have 40 panels uh, that are solid, 90 that are uh, glass, this will just give me, once I play, obviously uh, this will read the information and will uh, show sort of the proportion. Um, the last one is, uh, maybe I can zoom in or actually, let's see. It's easier to show on the scene. Oops. Right, the last one is sort of, uh, you know, the one of the uh, examples uh, of what else you could do. So this could be, for example, like a slider that goes between the menu and the maximum. So you don't have any units. You just put all of the data that you have. And once you walk around, like the slider moves uh, left and right according to like, you know, where in the spectrum of the menu and the maximum you are. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Am I, am I missing anything? Yeah, no? Uh, no. Okay, cool. So I will stop sharing and now Paris will um, show you the dashboard on a, in a play mode. Thank you, Justina, for explaining this. Uh, yeah, I mean, Justina did some really good work there on the data visualization and I can take over. Before I actually play this, I will go back and see our daylight analysis that before we just push the radiation values, now we will push also the selected spheres for the daylight analysis. Again, if any of you missed the first part of the presentation, you can see basically that each of these spheres does have a daylight factor assigned to it. So I can, yeah, it's spheres I select has a different value here. And yeah, and below that, I can see also uh, the, 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 the total mesh of this, uh, yeah, of this uh, uh, analysis, basically. So what I'll do is again use basic commands into reflect export. That will pop up this window of Unity Reflect that will allow me to export all this into my Reflect project. And again, I can go here, see the available content inside this Reflect project, and I can click export to add additional data on top of it. Let's wait for this to be done. It's still syncing. It's usually it's a process taking like a couple of minutes. So again, like for, for the amount of spheres, although the geometry is quite simple there. Um, yeah, this is already done. So this is quite a fast process, I would say. So if I go back to my Unity now, I can enter the specific project that I pushed. And if we wait for the syncing process to initialize and then finish. I can quickly also have a look here. Yeah, let's just wait this out for a couple of seconds. I'm wondering if it's a good opportunity to ask if there are any questions up until this point, any comments. Um, yes, please feel free also to like turn on your mics and yeah, jump in here. <laughs> Let's have a like nice discussion. <laughs> I'm gonna run this again actually. I guess my question about the Unity team was more uh, internally. You, you guys in the design technology group, 
Um, how many do you have that are dedicated to, or I, I, you may not even be dedicated, it might just be part-time, but how many people do you have that are working on the various scripts that you use that you hand off to the regular users? Yeah, exactly. So as, um, as I said, I mean, it's usually um, a one, uh, between one and three people involved in each of these uh, projects. Um, as I said, we don't, unfortunately, at this stage, we, don't, we can't afford to have uh, uh, you know, more resourcing to that uh, direction. We are building up, uh, you know, we're in the process of building up a bigger team. But yeah, so we, in a way, what Justina was saying, we need to make sure that we keep it very efficient and we don't, first of all, avoid uh, like reinventing the wheel. So the dashboard, I think, is a great uh, example. Um, obviously, as uh, Paris was saying, Game unit is a game engine, right? So anything that has to do with uh, user interface functionality most probably has been already to an extent being developed by somebody. It's more about like tweaking it and uh, finding interesting ways to make it relevant for what we do. Uh, so obviously having somebody uh, spending time and just um, developing from scratch a, a dashboard, it's not something that it's on the table for us at the moment. However, getting you know some basic functionality and using it as you've seen shows to, for example, to showcase like uh, what's the daylight uh, factor, how it changes as you move across, you know, along the building um, or the radiation analysis, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's where we put, you know, the energy and just being efficient with this simple, let's say, uh, scripts. Um, Thanks. Good to know that everyone's kind of bootstrapping. Yeah. Have you, you seen the teams making use of this? Is it helping them make educated decisions? So um, this is, yeah, it's an, I mean, it's an ongoing process and bringing people on board is actually part of what we do as well. Um, it does require certain, uh, you know, changes in the, in the mindset. I mean, most people are used to just looking at these, you know, uh, screenshots of these axonometrics of environmental analysis of all different and, and redoing reports, which of course are very useful and they are very much part of you know the, the, the process. However, um, we yeah, like with these uh, attempts, we're trying to create something much more intuitive, potentially something a bit more client facing. Um, so I guess this is where we. You know, we're truly interested in um, kind of investing and bringing people who are not necessarily specialists and understanding what's the performance of the building. So that's the way we see the most value at the moment. Yeah, and if I can check on your also on that, I, I would just say that, uh, yeah, myself as an XR developer, I keep seeing, you know, the design teams want to be, you know, like, uh, want to experience this immersive environment and like gives a better feeling of their designs, sense of scale. That's something that, um, like I, I think the knowledge is now starting to go forward. The design team starting to consider like using technologies like this, VR and collaborative design and uh, collaborative uh, platforms like this to basically you know experience their their designs better. So I think that that is something to that, that is to come. Uh, yeah. So if I can continue here, uh, we'll assign. Uh, Assign also the work texture here so we can see that. Already saw me doing that a couple of times, but I'll do that. Yeah, so if I jump in here. Yeah, so here we have the actual. Uh, data points, uh, as we were saying before. And yeah, just to quickly show the, we have extended the functionality of the UI, the, the reflect UI. So we have added like an additional button down here that basically will trigger our dashboard. And yeah, as we were saying before, basically we're calculating the closest point. It's being highlighted at this moment here. I can move somewhere closer and find another one. Uh, this 
still receiving any of the data. So we can see our dashboard getting updated uh, here on the left, uh, according to the closest point that I am right now. Uh, so yeah, you can see the values being updated here. And if I jump forward to the actual radiation values, uh, daylight values. So this is the our daylight analysis. Um, right here. Yeah, so that has picked it up. And yeah, if I can move a little. Yeah, so you can see down there, it's the highlighted sphere of this uh, daylight analysis. Yeah, the daylight analysis at the moment, it's just on this uh, uh, small classroom uh, office space. Um, yeah, and like I, I can see the sphere that's highlighted on the specific data point, and I can move around to get different daylight factor uh, values that is updating on runtime, and you can see our dashboard up here. And yeah, I think that's basically how our uh, workflow is working here. Um, Similar to that, the dashboard, yeah, as I said before, the dashboard is getting updated uh, while you fly around the, the model and you can see uh, the actual values of the radiation and daylight. So. Yeah, I think what we, uh, what we um, were also thinking about doing uh, while doing the dashboard is that obviously in a 3D space, um, you know, there is a limited number of meshes that you can visualize this at once. So this was like an extra step that, you know, because walk around, you can visualize, let's say, only daylight by, or only rotation. But on the dashboard, you could have like a sort of um, the summary of uh, all of the results. Um, and Paris, I don't know, uh, do we have the particles bit ready? Yeah, there's, there's one more bit. Yeah. So if I can just take over again and just show uh, another quick way that we found useful on visualizing some particle systems on top of this regular mess. So if I can go to our A, first thing I will do is go here. Sorry, I need a material. So. So I guess uh, what, what Paris is showing now is a, an alternative way of rather just ha than having the actual uh, analysis mesh, uh, which kind of sits on top of the geometry that we have there. Um, we thought of just uh, replacing that mesh with actually a particle system that it just sits as a layer of information on top of the actual geometry. So you can still get the color input of the actual values of the analysis, but without being necessarily distracted, or I mean, that's a good question from which distracted you get by the particle system. Um, <laughs> but I guess it's more about like fine, you know, fine tuning the aesthetics and making it, um, you know, uh, you know, bringing it to that level where you can maintain the fidelity of the geometry and the materials and the textures and their reflections and everything. But on top of that, apply, yes, have that extra layer of uh, information. Um, I mean, As well, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah that, uh, I think what's worth mentioning is that, you know, the, the, the bigger spheres that we're showing uh, right now, this is geometry that is coming straight from uh, Rhino, but you have the whole range of possibilities that, you, that the game engines are offering. Uh, so, you know, whatever, you, whatever, uh, um, uh, whatever you ever saw in any game, you can do it. Like if you want to have a uh, no explosion, or all, all the fun features that you have in your game, you, know, like you can use it as well here. So I think this add extra, you know, this extra layer of um, what what we can visualize. Um, so I think you know using particles um, to you know those small flying uh, dots is um, uh, it's just one way, but you can play with it and. Um, I, I don't think there is actually a lot of limits here. Like everything we saw in the game, you can do it here as well. I think that's a really good point, Sana. And um... well, and I think that um, it's worth mentioning that even here on the screen, while the screen is being shared, it's sort of a bit laggy, and you can only see, you know, every I don't know, ten frame of what's happening on Paris's screen. Um, but actually. Um, yeah, it's it's good to sort of take leverage of the 
uh, of the power of the game engine. And uh, this sort of visualization wouldn't be necessarily as easy in other, um, on, if we were trying to generate it on other platforms. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's why we wanted to present it uh, so that we don't need to always translate the geometry directly. Um, but as, as Justina said, we can use all the sort of game tactics uh, as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm for sure seconding everyone uh, on that. Uh, like, this is the big advantage of the of this of using this engine and these tools. Basically, you have the flexibility of yeah, enhancing all the the basic th just three D modeling functionality from the yeah from from Rhino and Revit and enhancing with like game features as as Reflect has already done with the multiplayer and the follow and like all these game features that we been looking on. Um, so I think that is pretty much it on the data visualization. I would like to mention one more quick thing on uh, the reflect side of things. So uh, just to mention here that reflect, um, as we've seen, it's a live link between our um, Revit or Rhino model, so we can yeah sync the have have the sync on in our, in the in the options on Revit, and I can see uh, basically update in real time. Um, that is very, very useful. Uh, although, as Joros mentioned before, the Reflect does not have a two-way communication yet. So closing that loop, it's not available yet, but uh, we'll, we have uh, information that this will be uh, in the upcoming uh, releases. One thing I, want to, I wanted to mention here, it's have you seen, as you've seen, uh, the streaming of all the objects coming from Revit and Rhino is happening on runtime. And this is, yeah, the, why we had to, yes, yeah, Wait out a little bit. Uh, Reflect does offer the flexibility, the, the, has the ability to basically load these geometries on um, on my Unity project and create something that they call like a static app. So this will not have a link to my original Revit model, but I can transfer my geometry. In. So yeah, I can bring in this geometry. If I hit import on that window, this window you can find under Windows window tab and then reflect window reflect window and i have this pop-up i just click download this will download all the data all the model data information for that are pushed on this reflect project and will store it in my asset folder so if i wait this out a little bit and then locate And basically, this is you know um, a bit of more robust way to bring in my geometry from uh, Rhino Revit, uh, not in real time, but bring it into Unity. Make your make your static application that can be again in any device. Um, yeah, well, Unity offers so many so many possibilities there, and I think that's again that, that's the big uh, advantage that we're getting out of. So once this is done, I can see hey. that it's already up. This is Ben from Core Studio again. When you do that download, does it still do that uh, that kind of streaming behavior on on load, or do you get the so, whole so lot at once? I get the whole thing at once, yeah. so it's not like 500, 5, uh, 5, 000 objects of what it was before. So I have like a whole thing now. So if I click locate here, I can see that basically now I have just a quick little folder here with one file of geometry. That is basically my um, yeah collective geometry of all the project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, still has the separate objects inside, but it's coming all together in a single pack. Right on. And does the does the Unity project or does the you know when you compile that thing out or build the whatever? Just I, I assume that gets a little bigger because it has that in it, correct? Exactly, exactly. So yeah, yeah, this yeah. now yeah. Is, is included in my Unity project. So for example, uh, if my pro my Revit project was a couple of gigabytes, um, Unity does do a big chunk of optimization on the geometry. So the, the actual file size, it's way, way much reduced from what's coming sure. from Revit. But still, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the build size and the project size is getting increased by, by the geometries being in here. Right on. Thank you. Very welcome. Um, yeah, and I think this brings us to 
yeah, a good point to basically wrap this Unity developer uh, side of things. Um, again, I just want to mention that uh, the building on Unity, you can build basically for all these available platforms and uh, Reflect does handle also universal render pipeline and high definition render pipeline, which yeah, the high definition render pipeline is mainly like focusing on you know, like high-end devices with RTX graphic readers and GTX 4000, I think, and up. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, again, with Unity, you can build on all this platform and this is will be, you know, like the point of contact between your design software and the actual uh, application you're trying to develop. And yeah, I think if you, anyone has any questions, please. Yeah, I have one more, um, at least. Uh, the I thought the particle system stuff was really cool. And then like data visualization, we do all this data viz stuff with you know engineering analysis results and TT. And I think you mentioned earlier like you were showing the in the workflow that everything had to be baked into Rhino. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I guess my question is: Has anybody looked at a grasshopper link, or do you know if that's on the roadmap for? Yeah, good point. Good point, Benjamin. So it, I think it was one of the first questions we kind of asked Unity. Um, yeah. It's on their roadmap for sure. Um, I guess there are, I mean, there are ways to work around that or people could potentially jump into developing that themselves. Yeah. But we know that the Unity are, are, are looking into it themselves. So I mean, for now, we just, yeah, we, we, we can wait. Um, yeah, that, that baking is the only part where actually the interop is kind of broken, right? And, and yeah, it's broken at least in two let's say, sides. Um, but yeah, I mean, for now, what we can just take care of, like, you know, what we can do is just utilize any op op automation we have on, you know, baking, creating layers, uh, pushing attributes to Rhino, and actually automating the syncing process. Almost. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, like but, Elefron, yeah. Uh, that, that's where Elefron came in. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so exactly. awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, so, I guess I was just curious. It seems like there's a lot of potential there to like use all the juice in the game engine to do data biz stuff. Really cool. We have been also in the past working with um, Rhino Compute and Unity. Um, so that's an alternative way. Uh, if, if, yeah. if it's just pure, um, you know, data viz, and it, maybe it's not as um, sort of data massive as, uh, as, as bringing in the full BIM model and so on. So I think Reflect is amazing when it comes to um, optimizing. Um, Revit models and, and sort of uh, really large BIM objects and processing the associated metadata. But then, yeah, uh, Rhino Compute is also an option, I think. Um, and we have experimented with it in, in, the, sure. in the past to, yeah, to do exactly that, to just take geometries uh, and outputs um, from, from Rhino Grasshopper and, and visualize them using the, the Unity toolset. Yeah, I, I think, think we saw a hackathon project, one of the AAC tech hackathon projects where like it, somebody tried to do Rhino inside Unity and like the entire Rhino installation ended up in the assets folder. Uh, we might know a few people, but Charlie, are you there? <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, know I don't want to throw anybody under the bus here. <laughs> they're, like, they can, they're free to de deny these allegations, right? We might know a few things about like putting the whole line inside Unity. Um, right fair, it was at the very, very beginning of uh, right inside. Um, yeah. And it, yeah, I mean, I don't know, yeah, that was comments. <laughs> that was the year that Rhino Inside and Rhino Compute first came out. Um, yeah. at, right at, as Ben every... mentioned, it was the annual AEC tech event, uh, typically in New York. And uh, so I've been following that kind of development. <laughs> A little bit at an arm's length away, just because of you know time constraints, um, and it seems like there have been some improvements um, on the Unity side that doesn't allow you to copy over the entire doesn't require you 
to copy over the entire Rhino development <laughs> into into Unity. Um, but there's there's definitely some work there that can be done um, to make improvements. Yeah, well, uh, I guess another way, I mean, as I said in the beginning, this is a bit of the holy grail, right? Like sending data to Unity from MainC and other AC platforms. Uh, Speckle, for example, is another solution, great solution for them to send data, for example. Um, and I guess the the whole association, the strict association of reflect with geometry kind of gives you a hint of where, as Natalia was saying, would be more useful for, I guess, like for the purpose of the workshop, we really wanted to push. Um, and if anything, like just uh, inspire people like ahead of the hackathon uh, for what could be potentially done and see, as we said, like with, we were very happy to see the units provided this, uh, we've been given basically 60, uh, trial licenses, right, uh, for people uh, for 30 days. So it's, you know, if somebody wants to just dive in in the next couple of days and see what else we can do with Reflect, that would be quite exciting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, we always say here, like, choosing the right tool for the right job. Uh, but bef before we know actually this is the right tool, we need to go through this process of experimentation and see where it breaks. Um, so I guess that's always part of the, of the process. Um, I don't know if you want to jump into the, uh, the, the Vive. Hey, yeah, yeah, I can, I can jump on the Vive. Uh, yeah. Just let me share my screen again. I mean, guess the whole, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's about like creating the immersive experience, I guess. Um, and uh, sorry, one of the things I wanted to say is like, because it, it was brought up in discussion yesterday, and I thought it's quite useful. Um, and and that has to do with regards to the extended, the, you know, the extended realities, let's say, um, let's say roadmap. Um, before we all found ourselves in you know, the past one and a half year in this very, you know, awkward situation that we are. Uh, of course, due to the pandemic and all that, we all we we our focus had been mainly on with regards to XR on uh, adding layers of information to physical models and uh, creating you know bringing that narrative, that element of narration, let's say, in physical models. Um, and us having found ourselves like you know working from home. Um, that has really shifted our attention towards uh, the virtual collaborative environment. So in a way, Reflect um, played or plays very nicely towards that direction. Um, and it's something we're very much interested in investing you know, in, the, in, in the immediate future. Uh, it gives us a great base to just bring back a bit of, the, you know, of that um, environment of collaborative uh, you know, processes. Uh, within this virtual world. So even these little things like the avatars and like being able to speak to people, uh, jumping in VR, um, yeah, and bringing that, these different streams of information. Um, I think these are very important uh, elements, especially with regards to you know, how we have all found ourselves working. Yeah, sorry. I'm. I'm. I think I'm ready to jump on the VR. Uh, yeah, you know, you know how it is. Like we need to have. Uh, I'm gonna remote myself to a more powerful PC just to use the VR headset. Yeah, uh, yeah, because this stuff uh, requires some computation, and my poor laptop is not handling that well. Um, yeah. So if I can just have a sec here to work the sound, this is already running there. Here we are. So I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Yes. Maybe. So I can hear you. I'm right there, please. Okay, so basically we're here. Uh, yeah, 
uh, this is the generic uh, OpenXR controllers, but you can see like all the functionality of the UI it's extended in here already. So I can, you know, give it go uh, teleport around the space. It has like Unity has managed to create colliders for its game object, so I can actually move anywhere in this uh, model. Uh, a bit far away. I can see someone is in here. Uh, yeah, and typical to what we did before, I can see basically here is our dashboard icon. So I can open this up and similar to what we did before, I can see, uh, I can get some information again about the radiation uh, that is updating kind of correctly. Yeah, so if I can try the inside there. I can also visualize the rest of the data there. I found that room with a radiation, with a daylight events. Yeah. Okay. okay. We made it. Yeah, so this is the daylight analysis. And if I to remove it here, and put myself out. Oh, right. So, yeah, that's the basic functionality of the VR. Uh, yeah, similar to what we did before. Uh, yeah, so I can switch over back to the fly mode. Again, it will the sync, and I have the file option information here available. Um, yeah, and I think like Rose did mention the daylight factor, which yeah, I think like this kind of features is what what gives some value to the to to the VR side of things. Uh, yeah, so I can maybe here. Yeah, and to go that. Date and time. It's yeah, as I said in the VR, I think like that's one of the the good things to have in here. Uh, I think that gives a little a little bit of a more immersive uh, situation. So yeah, I can also disable the saving. Is there any chance to to dock the data viz to your hand to the menus? Yeah, so that, that will be available. Uh, at the moment, we have it again as a canvas uh, in the screen, so that stays in a position around me. Uh, but that can be one of these panels, similar to as I have this in the controller. Yeah, now it's quite annoying in position that center, but like, of course, uh, we can choose between having it, in, you know, it's very nicely integrated within the kind of general UI or actually, as you uh, said, like part of the controller. So it can be turned on and off at will. Um, but yeah, I guess that comes back to the common flag. It's a game engine. Yeah, so I think like this is it. Sure, who's in there? Hmm. Not sure if there is anything else to show in here, but uh, yeah, I mean the, the immersive environment of the VR it is working, and I think uh, also I'm gonna take over my headset and stop sharing my screen actually. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think also Reflect has done a really big work on. Um, Connecting this with the Oculus Quest 2, which is yeah one of the most common and popular VR headsets right now, and yeah the, they have a client also available on the Oculus Store, which by the looks of it seems to be very well developed. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it with that. I think we can open the floor to questions or Carlos, anything else that we need to mention? Nothing. It'll be uh, quite interesting like, hearing people's. Opinions and maybe yeah, take advantage of the next few minutes we have to kind of yeah, 
like a discussion or questions actually, specific questions, maybe on the technical side or yeah, anything you might want to bring up. Well, first of all, a big, big thank you. This is, yeah, pretty awesome stuff. I mean, I didn't get the installation go, gone, so I'm going to do that over the weekend again. Uh, I think I need to do a proper purge and then reinstall again. Uh, but I'm going to play around with that, definitely. I think there's a lot of potential. And as Ben said as well, it's, it's that data vis that's, that's really interesting, actually, that extra layer that you can, uh, yeah, really build them out of building blocks, which is which is quite nice. Uh, thanks for it, Jeroen. I mean, we're going to be quite interested in seeing how some of the stuff that you guys have been doing, for example, the um, wind comfort uh, analysis, uh, which is another very kind of visual, if you want, and data rich um, exactly. part, how it can become something which can be accessible uh, as part of this immersive experience, right? Um, Absolutely, because there's a there's a load of data there, but it's really hard to make that uh, visual and understandable. Actually, like make it make it real, both towards clients and but as well in the design team to actually use that for the design. Um, and I think that's where the gaming engine comes in quite nicely because you can flip between the uh, perspective view between the the bird's eye view and um, streetscape uh, standing position. Um, yeah, yeah, I got the, the my, my head is spinning. <laughs> <laughs> I think the particle systems there can be very useful because um, you can add basically any sort of texture or a mesh uh, for shape of the particle system itself and a color. So if you imagine your CFD simulation, you could actually very lightly uh, bring it into the um, into the project uh, with yeah with all the data associated with um, with 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 the position uh, velocity um, magnitude um, you know you could sort of yeah um, map all that onto particle system and in a very light way uh, visualize it there which I think yeah is definitely has a lot of potential. No, absolutely, and it doesn't need to go actually that part doesn't need to go through Revit or Rhino. No, yeah. Um, so you could load in the whole model from Revit, which is actually mm -hmm. a, a heavy, big architectural model yeah. with the data of the, let's say, wind analysis. Absolutely. And then maybe even do some analysis further, the thermal comfort or something like that, um, to combine the whole ladybug analysis and actually get, a, get that going. Yeah, big, big potentials. Yeah, I guess the other side it would be also uh, uh, the, the sort of the structural analysis, like understanding, this, yeah. uh, or again, communicating some of the complexity and intricacies of structural analysis. And again, make that into a design tool in a way, because mm -hmm. we've, we've been talking about it, dreaming about, let's say, almost that um, you would play, place your, let's say, walls, beams, columns in Revit, and you actually see a structural diagram and almost like it tumbles down when it goes beyond capacity or something like that, uh, to actually really get that interactively back into the game engine. Um, I haven't got there, to be honest, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, and I guess to that, the, the bit of like closing the loop, that's the other one which we will, in a way, try to kind of start exploring. Um, and I'm not sure if it's so much about like manipulating the, the, the actual elements, like the BIM elements, if you want, but um, developing some general principles within this gaming environment um, that could easily be translated into uh, Revit and then be populated with the actual uh, you know, BIM elements that describe your building. I think that's another one that we would be quite keen over here to sort of start exploring. Um, and especially with regards to all the, you know, this, um, major focus that we have um, 
a lot of us have been doing recently now towards uh, DFMA. Um, and, and yeah, so there is a lot of uh, p potential. Um, as I said, we'd be quite excited to see if people would be, would be thinking of doing something along those lines for the hackathon as well. Any other comments, questions? Um, on my side, I just wanted to mention, sorry, sorry to whoever was going to say anything. On my side, I just wanted to mention that, yeah, girls did mention that, uh, you know, the, the, the reflect comes with some, some AR capabilities uh, out of the box. So yeah, they, they do have uh, those uh, like clients uh, for smartphones. I think they also have an iOS and an Android uh, version of the application. For me, I mean, like, I would love to explore, reflect more because, you know, you know, like the the AR space is getting updated <laughs> daily now nowadays. Like the AR foundation, it's like adding features uh, constantly. So for me, th there is much of a possibility there. Uh, trying to see how we can actually add this on the daily work for design workflow. And yeah, just just want to mention that. Uh, so was. Thank you, everyone. I have a quick uh, question. And thank you again for the, this session. It was really informative. I was thinking that uh, in your exploration from software to software, have you encountered any possibility to, I mean, uh, analyze and simulate uh, lots of these environmental analysis like, uh, you know, Bain's comfort zone, anything like this in Unity? Because as far as I remember, Unity 3D is much faster than other computational, I mean, computation regarding ladybug and things like this because it used GPU and things like this. Uh, have you encountered any possibility to do this simulation in Unity? That's, That's a great question. Sorry. Um, so do want to go. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that there is, um, you know that the, there is much of uh, the, the any assets at the moment sort of that you could use out of the box. But yeah, you're absolutely right that from um, the from, from from the infrastructural perspective, that would be very um, it would be very good place to build um, build environment where you can simulate. Um, I think you know there is there is a lot of um, sort of physics simulation um, capabilities that are already there within the gaming engine. Um, because you've got, uh, you, you, you sort of have the physics behavior uh, sort of embedded within um, the definitions of game objects. Um, so, so to every game object, you can apply a rigid body with a set of physical properties. And um, you can sort of, for that reason, of course, that's for, that's, that's, that's to uh, be able to, to enable um, the creator to, make realistic um, sort of nature or landscape simulations, as well as um, agents um, who can move um, realistically and, and respond to their environment. Um, so so that's, um, that set of interactions is already there. So uh, if you can build on top of that, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, just add a layer of environmental um, relationships, uh, to to the physics base, uh, physics basis that is already there, then that would be definitely uh, worth exploring. I don't think it's been done yet, but uh, we have definitely sort of uh, discussed it as you know that that being a good place to um, to to um, yeah, it, it being an interesting thing to explore. I think. Thank you. Yeah, just to check on that, on Natalia. I mean, uh, yeah, as Natalia said, the, the physics engine, the physics engine, it, it's there in Unity, and this is for for definitely something that we can benefit of uh, here with the Reflect. Um, yeah, and in addition, um, I, I, I think like based on your question, Hamid, I mean, uh, I guess you know, like you know how design teams are, are most of the. They're used to using like Rhino and Revit, so I think like that's why we're trying to, you know, like support these decisions, if I may, and like uh, capabilities of the design teams. 
and uh, but Unity is a it's a it's a it's a really good platform to start thinking about simulating uh, additional analysis information. Yeah, thank you. All right. So um, again, in terms of uh, housekeeping and everything, we have hopefully all of you will have uh, received links to G Drive and. Again, if you still have any issues with licenses and that, please let us know. I want to make sure that you know, we could make use a good use of the content we have prepared for these workshops. Uh, Actually, in addition to that, uh, yeah. Jack, the sales rep from Unity, he just created an Ask Unity channel in the AC Tech um, Slack workshop workspace. Oh, yeah. So actually, we can directly ask questions there as well. He'll he'll monitor it over the weekend. And to add to that, your own Jack has produced a very useful video, which we're going to share with you. I don't know if he already put it on the Slack channel. Already, it's already there as well. Yeah, yeah, All he right. sent he sent it last night. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna. I mean, we will email it again to all of the uh, participants of the, for the past uh, two days, and just in case somebody's not on the Slack channel, um, or if they're not continuing with the hackathons. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a very useful one. It kind of shows you. Uh, again, some of the stuff we've shown, as in how to get started with Reflect. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's directly from the source. So, it's a good point of reference. Um, just to remind as well that uh, tomorrow, Unity will be giving a technical presentation during the hackathon in the technical session. So, if you have, for those of you that will be uh, taking part in the hackathon, if you have more, uh, you know, questions, um, you can ask directly, uh, Jack. I think Jack will be giving that presentation. Um, so yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so you can uh, uh, talk to him. Yeah, and as we said, we're looking forward to see if, uh, whether there will be any sort of developments on that site during the past two days. Mm. Cool, thank you. Yeah, we'll be kicking off the hackathon in like 25 minutes, half an hour uh in the ring central meeting link i'll also post it in the slack channel in a bit um and i'll go through the points and how we access because we're we're going to do those presentations with unity um in spatial chat actually so it's going to be a little experiment for us as well we'll see nice. how that goes but yeah um right so i mean with that i think we I would like to thank again uh, the uh, um, first of all thank you uh, guys for joining and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the session um, the, uh, you pick, uh, you've seen something that could be potentially useful would like to thank again uh, the TT uh, core team uh, for inviting us again to co-host this AC Tech 2021 event it's been a really great opportunity for us um, and yeah, I guess uh, we'll see you in a bit in the uh, kickoff of the hackathon. Thank you. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Great stuff. Thank you.